Hey, Randy. <laughs> Thanks for your call today, Randy. Hey, are you living with ugly floors? Why? 54 can upgrade your home fast and save you a ton of money. With free installation on carpet, hardwood, vinyl, and lamp, 54 will move your Yeah, this is why I got to mute everybody. Install your new floors. Clean up and there we go. So we just got about a minute here to go. I, I know I know some of you can hear me because uh, you've waved. If you can hear me, wave. Hey, okay, okay, that's great. Okay, thank you, thank you. I know my video. I know my audio is working. I, I uh, <clears throat> wait here. We got 63 people on so far. It's starting to ramp up here a, a little bit. Um, Crystal, I'm waving. LOL. Thank you. Um, up to 71 now. Here we go, we're at seven o'clock, so it's time to start our meeting today. So first of all, I wanna show you the mask. I show you guys this the last time, um, the mask that my daughter got me from uh, the MG Owners Club out of England. So if, you're, if you wanna be cool, I mean, there's not much COVID left, right? I mean, we're, we're running right down to the end, but look at this, is this cool or what? You know, I mean, I mean, if, you know, I, I think I'll probably take this to, uh, the meet in Atlantic City. So anyway, welcome to uh, the May 24th MG Technical Zoom session. Let me explain how this all works. We got 81 people online. Dave Clark, when he's online, is always our official, um, as our official counter. And he'll tell us from time to time how many people we've actually got online. So Doug Clark, it is Doug Clark, and we've got 83 now, John. 83, Doug Clark. That's what I meant to say. Doug, our official <laughs> counter. Thank you very much. Um, so um, um, I put everybody on mute. That I mean, it's not because I don't like you, but there's always that background noise. So you can either go on my computer, you can go to the top right of the screen, and you can click on gallery view or or speaker view. If it's gallery view, you get a thousand little postage stamps, well, not a thousand, 87 right now, of the people who are online. And then the people who are speaking end up being on the primary screen uh, surrounded in yellow. You can also go to speaker view and get a larger view of the person if you want You want to see the person as much as you want to hear what, what they've got to say. There's a chat box at the bottom on the bottom ribbon, at least on my computer, that's where the chat is. And you can post your questions in chat there and we'll get to them, they're timed. Um, have you considered starting at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight? Hey, I, I can do it, you know, I mean, yeah, cause it's like, you know, I got no problem starting at 8 p.m. Eastern, you know, let's do that next time. I'll, I'll, I'll try to remember. Although I do have a question about that. Um, when I read your question off mute, um, then I'll say, hey, you know, Bob's iPad or Mr. Mearden or whoever it is, is, um, uh, is posed a question. Then you can unmute yourself and we can talk. Always fun to know where you're from and, and uh, what car you've got, those kinds of things. Um, but if you have something to add, you know, when we're talking, I don't mind at all. You can unmute yourself and just break in and say, hey, you know, uh, this is my experience with this or something. Just follow along for a while. Most of you have been here before. So um, I've got a couple of notes for tonight. Um, one, you know, I've started doing my, my videos again in earnest. I've got another, I don't know, 10 up now or something like that, or a dozen, I guess. And I was looking at the comments on those the other day. Now, I don't look at the comments on them very much because there's always people that say, oh, this guy's got, uh, you know, got his head up, his, you know, and, and he doesn't know what he's doing and you shouldn't connect it there. 
all I can say is, hey, you know, this is the way that I've been doing it, and it works for me. And and I, you know, I'm not the I'm not the last person you want to listen to. You know, take take a poll of a couple of people and see what's reasonable for for you. Anyway, so sometimes I don't read them because of that. But some guy wrote in, I assume it was a guy, and said, this guy is not a poser. Look at those hands. Now my hands are clean today, nice and clean because. When I get done working, I use I use Tide Tide detergent uh, in a scrub brush. If you use that all the time, you'll wreck your nails. But on occasion, you know, as often as you get them dirty, uh, you can use Tide and get your hands nice and clean. But during that video up at my little shop, my hands were pretty filthy, dirty. But I I love that. I spent this past weekend at Mark Brandow's shop. Quality Coaches in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I go up there every year for a seminar. This year is really late, and it was only one day this year. It's usually a two-day seminar. Next time when I go up, I'm going to stay a couple extra days because he's always got work for me to do. Um, when I go down to uh, Washington, D.C., whenever that is, whenever Randy s sets that that up, um, It'll, you know, whether it's in September or July or I, I don't know when, but I'll be down there for a while and, and can help some people out. The, um, the next Zoom session that, that I have scheduled is the second Tuesday in June. And that's Monday, the opening day of, of the big MG 2021 in Atlantic City. So I'm still undecided. Am I going to do my Zoom session from there? You ought to be there. But if you're not there and and uh, so forth, am I going to do my Zoom session that, or a week later? I'm not. I'm not exactly sure yet. So we'll we'll hold that out as uh, as a floating date. Let's go through some numbers here. I looked at this stuff just before I came online, and uh, Facebook, the University Motors Ltd. Facebook followers. Uh, I I brought some new ones in. I've got 3,404. Facebook followers, the constant contact mailing list. Thank, uh, thank everyone for going on there and 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 putting your name in there to get information. That's up to 55,151, 5151 tonight. Uh, Facebook uh, followers is. Um, I already said that, sorry. Uh, YouTube subscribers. That's this is a pretty interesting number. This is um, uh, twenty thousand. 832. I, and I don't know, I don't get an email when I put a new, a new video up, but I think what happens, silly me, I'm not really sure, is when I think when I get one up, you're alerted somehow on, 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 on YouTube that there's another video up. The most recent one I think I just put up was the, about the gas tanks. And YouTube views have now swelled. I'm almost, I'm neck and neck with Britney Spears. I'm so excited. Um, at 9,140,000. So that's just a huge number. Um, I, I, I do this because I love it. I, 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 I just, I love helping people with MGs, but I love it when you help, help me back a little bit. So when you, when you go on my, on my um, website, universitymotorsltd.com, and you're looking for a copy of the complete loop, or you're looking for some information. There's also a PayPal button that, there that says something like, you know, help John in, uh, afford his retirement. And, and I do appreciate all of you who make payments. And I haven't thanked anyone for the last three sessions. So suffer, suffer through this while I publicly thank the people who have donated uh, money to me and it's very very kind very very kind of everyone to have done that and the the, the amounts just range all over the place some people have got me on on a repetitive thing like five bucks a month or ten bucks a month hey uh, every everything helps some some people make a pretty a pretty handsome uh, occasional do donation but those people include brad worthington stanton woods Robert Cortan, Brian Hepburn, Ken Rosenberg, Lawrence Prang, Hollis Becker, Gary Maves, Craig West, Doug Clark, Steve McClune, Charles Roche, Eduardo Hauer, John Burroughs, 
Roger Searle, Tom Weisel, Bobo Tanner, Azim Batia, Bob Betzinger, Tom Weisbecker, Dean Wheeler Jr., Henry Morgan, Tom Snook, Stefan Spielman, John Cook, Timothy Ross, Phil Kalura, Jim Robinson, Bob Quinn, Mike Reynolds, Les Bankson, his name came up in conversation today, Norm Kelly, Greg Moradian, Steve Malloy, Daniel Eastman, Terry Morris. I'm not done. I'm only part way through here. Thank you very much for everyone. Um, David Vincent, Jim Hargrove, Doug Clark again, thank you. Judy Shuda, Ben Andrews, Jack Mulliner, Gary Maves again, thank you. Roberta Johnson, Ned Matura, Mike Dowie, Bobo Tanner, Dennis Johnson, Robert Cook, John Welch, Barry Jacobs, Walter McCall, Brock Dittrich, Alan Beecher, Dean Wheeler again, John Uhas, Tom Starkweather, David Massey, Ken Rosenberg, again, I think, Bill Fisher, Charlie Foy, Bill Rosevear, Doug Miller, Vern Bankson again, Gwendolyn Mitchell, Doug Wolfire, Doug Clark, Kurt Johnson, Fred Lessiker, Tom Capehart, Daniel Eastman, Nathan Dickerson, John Danley, Rodolfo Cortez, Dave Vincent, Gary Martin, Abingdon Spears, Ed Cook, uh, Mel Shotton, Sandy Brainsky, Dave Cray, Alan Divorcey, Tom Capabianco, Jake and Ann Snyder, Rob Nichols, Dan McGovern, Otmar Renkin, Elizabeth Arnold, Dave Smittle, Skip and Susan, James Nybert, Brent Smith. So anyway, thank you very, very kindly. And I, 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 mean, I, I mean to write a note to each and every one of you. I know I haven't done that, which is my obligation. Um, but I, I'm publicly your thank and thank you very much. Thank you very kindly. So tonight, our opening, um, our opening discussion is about um, getting your car ready and drivability. So um, last time, I just I picked overdrive out of nowhere, just picked it out. I just got I I think I just got done rebuilding my daughter's. Uh, overdrive. And so I thought, well, that'd be a good subject. And oh my gosh, that caught in the, almost the entire session last time was about overdrives. There were a couple of questions about brakes and some other stuff, but just offhand, it was almost all about overdrives. I had no idea that it was uh, such a popular subject and, and we did talk about it quite a lot. But tonight it's about drivability. And that is having fun in your car, being able to get into your MG and drive it and really truly enjoy it, making it drivable. So here are my few notes about drivability. First of all, it's nice to have a clean car. We used to, every now and then when I ran my shop, we'd have cars come in, I just couldn't stand it. Candy wrappers and, and, and just stuff, stuff everywhere. And I'd say, well, you know, it would, part of the deal was that we always cleaned the car before we gave it back to the customer. And sometimes I'd take a cardboard box and put everything in the cardboard box from their registration to the 13-week-old um, McDonald's French fries that we found underneath the seat. So every now and then, of course, we'd find something really embarrassing in someone's car. We never outed them for that kind of stuff, of course, of course. Um, but anyway, you want to have a clean car. It's just really nice. The next thing is you want a car with gasoline. I mean, this is just straightforward, stupid stuff. I had a guy, um, when we were up on Fulton Street in Ada, 
I had a guy walk into the shop with a, with a very young daughter. I mean, she must have been seven or eight or something or other. And he sh sort of sheepishly said, well, I just ran out of gas. This is an adult male with a child. I ran out of gas. I said, hey, no problem. And, and I got a gas can and we went in the car and went down. He got enough gasoline. On the way down there, he allows that this is the second time that this has happened. It's like, I said, dude, you know, I got to tell you what your grandfather's been telling you. You know, if you're going to drive on half a tank, drive on the top half. So anyway, have a, have a full tank of gas. Then you don't have, all of a sudden you want to go have a drive. You don't have to stop in the gas station and get gasoline on your hands or something. Everything that the driver touches should be tight and functional. So if there's only one window winder in the car, if there's only one, the other one's broken off, it should be on the driver's side. If there's only one wiper that really works and clears the windscreen, it should be in front of the wipe in, in front of the driver. The pedals should should move back and forth, side to side, and wobble, um, which they do terribly in some T types. And the pedal free play ought to be the same. The, seat rate adjustment ought to be okay. You ought to be able to adjust the position of the seat. The door should close and open easily. The window should roll up and down easily. When you grasp the switches, the turn signal switch, the wiper switch on the column, they shouldn't move together. You know, it just, just the steering wheel should be straight. And these are just straightforward kinds of things that that make the car, you know, make driving the car a pleasure. And then, of course, it's got to stop and start and run. So it's no fun going out and driving the car, especially with, like with, with a Weber, downdraft Weber or something, you get that terrible Weber stall, you know, you go to accelerate and it goes, and then it takes off. Um, but those are more difficult and more expensive problems to sort out than, than whether the seat slides back and forth. But that's just it, drivability. Uh, you just, you know, you know, you just pay attention to your car. So when you go out and you take somebody out in it, whether it's your wife, your girlfriend, when your wife isn't home, um, your grandkids, your kid, whatever, you know, please, you know, just have it, have it set up and set to go. And, and nice and comfortable and, and everything. I mean, there's, there's just, there's no end of the stories. You know, the kid that, that uh, got the banana and put it in his backpack and put it in the back of the MG. And then you wonder what that smell is like three, three months later, you know, and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a colony of flies back there. So anyway, just keep the car clean, keep it neat, keep it gassed up, keep it set to, to go and you will enjoy it. So anyway, that's just my, my simple comments as a start tonight. And I'm gonna go back over to the to the chat section if I can do this. I think so, I gotta roll this. In. Okay, all right. So the first one in the chat section tonight is um, is un, uh, is not identified. So when, when I, it's a 54, uh, it says FT, I'm sure it's a TF. And when I go up through the gears, there's a clacking noise that I feel in the in the stick in the gear shift knob. So who's uh, who, who's complaining about their TF in this noise? Me, uh, me, John, Chaz. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I feel it uh, in the in the stick shift as I ask something of the motor. If I'm just going down the highway straight, it's okay. But when I step on the gas, it's a clacking, and I feel it up through the gear shift knob. And this this happens in all gears. Uh-huh. Well, let's see. We can suggest it's just about a hundred things. Do uh, you have wire wheels? Uh-huh. Okay. So even though you can feel it and hear it in the gear shift knob, doesn't mean that that's where the problem is, right? The noise or the, the thing can be transmitted. So it can include, it can include as many things as I'll, I'll try to think of here and list, that is that the spines are bad in the back, the wheels are loose against the spines. You can tighten the spinners up, but that only holds it for the next eight miles or three miles and then they come loose again. 
um, that requires tables and, and new hubs. Yeah, I redid most of the splines uh, this winter, so they're all pretty tight. Great. How about the drive shaft? Uh, unfamiliar. I've only had the car six months. The drive shaft, it looks new, and I replaced the clutch this winter, too. Okay. All right. So what I was going to propose is that the drive shaft is loose because of bad U joints, but if it's a new drive shaft, that may not be the case. But it could be the bolts that hold the, the drive shaft to the to the differential or to the gearbox uh, are, okay. are are loose. I mean, something something's going on here. There is a there is a peculiar a peculiar easy for me to say chatter chatter that comes out of the gearbox on acceleration on some t-types and but it's rattly it's it's not just one clack it's rattly is that what you get is a rattly or is it well, it's it's uh it's it's rhythmic it's clack 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 well I don't think it's in the clutch. I don't think it's in the engine. I, I don't think it's in the gearbox because you didn't probably change that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I'd, go, I'd go for for that drive shaft. I was driving a couple of cars this weekend at, in Minneapolis and much to the owner's horror, um, I said, well, hang on because I'm gonna jerk the car here pretty severely. And in, like in second gear at 30 miles an hour, I put my foot on the throttle and off and on and off and make the car hop. I mean, the car's like, rant, 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 rant. and I'm listening as the, as the drive shaft and the rest of the, uh, um, everything where you can have lost motion is spinning up and, and, and uh, coming back, taking the, the, the torque and the thrust. So you might try that and see if that comes up or just get back underneath the car and check that drive shaft. And, yeah, I didn't even thought of the drive shaft. I'll uh, I'll check that now. Yeah, I was worried about gearbox or transmission or something, but uh, fair enough. You got plenty of oil in the gearbox. Yeah, it's all new. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, that'll give me a direction. I appreciate that's a, it. That's a start. And and my comment to you and to everybody else on the board here is that um, if if you run into a snag at some point, you know, and you just you can't make sense out of it. Or you just want to vent. I got one of those phone calls to, to today, just venting. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, just call. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I, where, where, where you are is where I've been. And, and I've, I've been through an awful lot of this stuff. Oh, it's too much fun to vent. <laughs> the cars are too much fun. <laughs> Great. Okay. All right. Chaz. Where, where are you calling from, Chaz? Uh, Indianapolis. Okay. All right. Okay. doke. Good luck. Thank Thanks. You. Okay, so we've got the, our next comment here, if I can somehow make this work. Just a moment here. Um, oh, here, I somehow I didn't get to, to the top. Jeff has a question about my video number 002. Have you considered, oh, um, what's the, uh, what's the question, Jeff, unmute yourself and well, what's your question about video 002, which of course I don't know what which one that is. I know which number one is, but I don't know what number two is. Jeff, this is there? Jeff Fields near Grafton, Ohio. Jeff, Jeff, I'm real happy to find out that Bob Sateva hasn't passed away. So he has, he has not. But what you're, it's, not, it's, you're not getting our Lord Nuffield criers. No, no. So. I'll see what I can do about that. Okay. Um, the video referred to how to start your MGA. Okay. And um, you talked about, uh, you know, doing everything and you push the throttle down. You didn't say how soon to let the throttle up. You push the throttle down so that when you pull the choke out, it's, it, the cho you know, the choke does two things. It's dropping the jets. And it's and it's pushing that cam up to lift the throttle up. So you push the throttle down, pull the choke out, and then you can let the throttle back back up again. So I okay, I haven't said that. And just an aside, some people have said, you know, some of those original videos, the video quality, I don't know if they're copies of copies or I, they're sure not playing VHS tapes back there, but um, some of the quality and some of that stuff's getting pretty crappy, so I, I should redo some of those early. 
And anyway, you just press it down. It, MGB also, um, or, or for that matter, T-type, um, you press the throttle down so that when you pull the choke out of the dash, it doesn't have to move the throttle also. That's all. Very good, very good. Um, I only think we should start at 8 p.m. when we're supposed to be doing yard yard work till 8 p.m. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, let's uh, next one we'll do at 8 p.m. How's that? We'll we'll try it and see. I know it'd be better handier because I we had uh, David Knock weigh in uh, a couple of times from uh, from California British Car Service, and he you know he's still at work. You know it's it's. Uh, it's almost the day before out there, so um, he he was still he was still at work and wasn't able to log in as easily. So eight o'clock, we'll try that next time and see how it goes. So thank thank you for that effort. Hope to see you in Atlantic City just to say hi. Let's have a vote. What, what's that? Let's have a vote on what time to start. How are we going to have a vote with all these people here? <laughs> you no, know, we'll just we'll try it at eight. And right now, Doug. Uh, Doug's my official counter right now. I see we're at 154. So we'll see if the numbers change. Of course, like any scientific experiment, you're only supposed to change one factor at a time. And we're going to change another factor. And that is that some of you will be in Atlantic City. And the other factor is that it's two weeks from now or two or three weeks from now. And so that's that's a, another thing. Well, let's just try it. Let's just try it. I don't know how we do a vote. So, all right. Okay, Jeff, thank you very, very kindly. Um, Kurt Johnson weighs in and said, the new videos are excellent in my humble opinion. Thank you very kindly. I've been after my videographer, young Max Perwin. He's the, he's the son of my land, uh, son of one of my landlords. Um, I said, you know, I, I've got to mute everybody here because we got some background noise. Um, when I went to pay him for the last videos that he did, um, I said, you got this, you know, you're missing this one important thing on all the videos. He was kind of taken aback. And I said, dude, your name isn't on there. He said, well, they're, they're your videos. And I said, no, put your name on there, you know? You know, maybe somebody else in Comstock Park, Michigan, which is Northwest quadrant of Grand Rapids, um, I said, maybe they, you know, maybe they're watching and maybe they'd hire you too. So anyway, I'm, I'm real pleased. He's, he's worked very, very hard at it. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan. He's a filmographer. He's been sending his resumes out to everybody in the world to, to try to get a job shooting film. But while he's stuck mowing the lawn and moving furniture and sweeping and doing all that kind of stuff you do for your family business, He's taking videos for me, so it's working out really well. So anyway, um, Kurt, thank you very kindly for your comment. Okay, so now we've got from 62 Cha, C-H-A. Um, that's what it says on, on my screen here. Um, oh, that's the clacking noise. That's the clacking noise. That's we, we already did that, Chaz. Thank you very, very much. All right, so now we got Ned Strong. So let me just read Ned's comment here, and then... Um, Ned can, can unmute himself and come on. I just finished rebuilding my 66 transmission. He doesn't say, but let's assume it's a B. I'm ready to install it, but I have a question. When I hold the input shaft and the output shaft, it seems to work well in all four gears, but in neutral, there's resistance when you hold the shafts and twist them in opposite directions. Is this normal? Well, yeah, kind of. Chat. Um, Ned, are you right there? You, I'm yeah, here. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Okay. All right. Well, you know that when you're turning the the rear flange, you're turning two bearings, two two bearings, and a needle bearing. And when you're turning the front mo first motion shaft, you're turning one bearing, the needle bearing, and the lay gear and the speed gears. So there is some resistance. It shouldn't, I mean, it's not just like you could put a, a little flag on it and blow on it and have it spin around. It's, it's, but you know, how much resistance should there be? Um, if you've assembled it correctly and, and the, the rear nut is tight, 
Um, everything is pulled into position, so there just can't be too much trouble. It's so hard to tell, you know, what's, what do you think is too much resistance? You can turn it with both hands? Yes, yes, but, you know, with a little effort. Well, it's probably okay. <laughs> well, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no oil in the, in the, in the gearbox yet. So no, maybe that's but, part of it. Yeah, no, nah, maybe, maybe. And although usually when you assemble it, usually you assemble it with grease or oil. I sure yeah. do. Um, Which I did. Yeah, I did. I did. I did do that, thankfully. Okay. And you, you had this apart because you changed the lay gear or the, or I the, did. I changed the lay gear and the uh, second, uh, second gear, um, Synchro. Uh, synchro. Okay. Which it, it had a steel one in it. It's supposed to have a brass one in it. So I put the brass okay. one back in. Good thing you logged on tonight. And I hate to make your job worse, but you got to take it back apart again. This is so embarrassing. Um, oh, you no. <laughs> back apart again and put that steel synchro back in it. Unless you are certain that the gear shown. Um, if if you send me an email, I, I just I'm you know if my daughter was here, she's in Los Angeles. If she was here, she'd say, well, Dad, just press this button, and I would call up the picture of these two gears. But there is a brass gear and there is a steel gear. I mean, yeah, yeah. Brass yeah I saw that video, and that's why I changed it to brass because the uh, the one the uh, the gear didn't have the little humps. It, was it didn't flat. have little scallops in it. No. No, well, have okay, all right. Well, that's weird because they introduced that steel synchro in 65, but I mean, help me out. That was, uh, what, 55 years ago? Is that about right? I mean, you know, so yeah. So anything could, could have happened in the meantime. And the synchro was absolutely not working before. No, it was gone. Okay. Okay, all right. Uh, hey, John, John, this is Barney. Yeah, Barney. Uh, the other relative motion inside the gearbox when it's in neutral, when you turn the input shaft, it turns the lay shaft, and the lay shaft turns the gears on the main shaft. <coughs> Second gear and third gear are rotating on bronze bushings on the main shaft. If you just put bronze bushings in there or if those things are dragging, it would tend to make the output shaft turn. <coughs> Okay, oh. so so anyway, so and Bar Barney is speaking from MGA experience, although it's the same, it's the same gearbox. They finally they finally made the dramatic improvement in 1967 and increased the diameter of the lay gear, lay shaft by a sixteenth of an inch, something or other, and put two sets of needle bearings in it, front and rear, rather than um, having one end just having the one set of needles and they made this dramatic improvement and then ditched the thing the next year for the all synchro box which is just so far superior but anyway so anyway if you if you paid attention to that to that gear and and everything that should be a brass gear did you happen happen to lap that gear with lapping compound to the speed gear oh <laughs> no, I didn't do that. Okay. All right. So this is a, this is a cautionary. Um, I, you know, it depends. On, I mean, taking that whole thing back apart is, is a real bear. But putting it in the car to find out it doesn't work and then having to take it out again. So you got to take a risk here. But I discovered, um, oh, my gosh, it must have been 20 years ago when I was talking to, wait, 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 um, just a minute, Chris Nolan. Uh, who, who worked for Moss Motors. He was the purchaser there for years. Um, and he said, well, of course you, la of, of course you lap the, the synchros into the speed gears before you fit them. I said, okay, news to me. Anyway, he's the one that told me about it. And I did that ever since. And every single time those synchronizers would work. And if you didn't do it, they wouldn't work. I, you know, I, Help me out. I, I'm not exactly sure why, uh, but they they weren't mating. They weren't mating against that that conical conical face. So as a cautionary, everybody else who's going to do a gearbox today, tomorrow, ten years from now, 
laugh those two things together, just those valve lapping compound that you can buy from Napa, you know, for, for uh, lapping valves. Anyway, so it's, it, you know, it's like, uh, you're gonna take it, I've already told you to take it apart once and you, and you, uh, you escape that. So here, here's, here's, here's the next one, so I don't know. Well, that, that'll be the third time. <laughs> right. Okay. So anyway, that's that's um, I think Barney Barney's answered that you know that you're running on some bronze bushings in there and and uh, even that'll end, end up tr trying to carry the main shaft. Well, you know when you put the car in gear, uh, excuse me, when you have it in neutral and you have it up on jack stands and you start up the engine, the engine's spinning and the first motion shaft is spinning. Um, it's very, very easy for one of the rear wheels or both rear wheels that the brakes aren't dragging more on one side than the other to have that, that motion carry through. So I think you'll be okay as far as the resistance to turn. Thanks, John, uh, appreciate where, it. Where are you, Ned? I'm in Arlington, Massachusetts. All right, okay, welcome. Thanks. O Okie doke, Ned Matura. Hi, John, hi, Ned. I hope your foot's still okay. Um, from, from Brad, from Brad, I had to replace the passenger rear axle seal on my 77 MGB recently. When I tapped in the seal, it went in too far, an eighth of an inch too far. In other words, it wasn't sitting flush with the outer housing. It seems to be working. Uh, should I take it out because, because maybe something's gonna go wrong? As long as it's not blowing oil, you're okay but it should, it should be flush. When we ever did rear brakes on an MGB, um, we always did everything at once. Both rear hub seals, the shoes and the cylinders, um, always, and then put on turn drums. Um, because if it's like going into a factory and changing one, one fluorescent light, it's like, yeah, as soon as you get the ladder down and put, put away, Station number 28 calls and says their lights out too. Best just go through and change them all. So, um, but anyway, to your point, if you drive it in too far, I know it leaks because we had a, we had that happen on a customer car one time. One of my guys drove the thing in just stupid far, and um, he came back and of course there's all oil all all over the brand new shoes and all over the inside of his wheel. But you know you get those straight lines that shoot out of the wheel when anything's leaking back there because the oil oil gets flung out from centrifugal force. So as long as, it's, as long as it's not got oil on it, as long as you've got oil in the differential, you'll be okay. So where's Brad? Where, where are you? I'm in uh, Vancouver, BC. Oh, okay. All right. Been there. Okay. Something about yes, thank the- you. Something Thank about you for that. Um, to that, I would I just had the story. I've had the car for almost forty years. I don't think I've ever worn out a set of brake shoes. They inevitably get destroyed by failed axle seals and failed um, brake okay. cylinders. <laughs> it's very very odd to run the brakes out with the, with the kind of driving that we do, is occasionally, as we do and so forth. I'm going to be in. Um, um, Portland, Oregon, uh, on, on our Labor Day, first weekend or so of September. Fingers uh, crossed, I'll, I'll see you in Portland. But excellent. I so, got to get across the border first, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the reason that the Home Depot told me that the two by fours here were six bucks, you know, it's because they couldn't get lumber from Canada. No, it wasn't that, it was the peat moss. I wanted peat moss and the, our local place said, no, nope, border's closed, can't get peat moss out of Canada. And it's like, oh, does that carry COVID? Come on, come on. Anyway, maybe by the, the middle of the summer, maybe hopefully by the end of the summer, it'll all have calmed down and just be a, a dreadful distant memory. So anyway, thanks, thanks for checking in, Brad. Oh, N Ned Matura, here we go. How smooth can an MGB four-cylinder engine run? I have a Weber on a four-speed 76 um, MGB, no overdrive. 
I disassembled and cleaned out the water choke, which is clogged with some dried coolant, and remounted it firmly in, into, uh, into the car. And now it has a more stable idle. I've been idling at eight to 900 RPM. The fast idle screw has been adjusted so that it pops up to about 2000 RPMs and then drops to 1600, 1200, and finally to the eight to 900 range. It seems like the idle could get smoother. The engine has a bit of pattern to the idle, runs smooth, has a bit of a shutter, then it runs um, smoother. The RPM needle has a slight dip uh, and then back, and this happens every five to eight seconds. Well, the problem, this is a downdraft Weber, right, Ned? Yes, it is. Okay, so the problem is that the intake manifold, if you put your hand on it, is like ice cold because you've got all this, all this, all this evaporation go, going on. And because it's so cold and you're at idle, the gasoline drops out of suspension and actually puddles. And then the engine changes the way it runs. And then at some point it starts to run faster, pulls that gasoline up that's, and, and, it, and it makes it too rich. So you're getting this uneven idle from the gasoline dropping out of suspension. There isn't much of a, a solution for it. Um, the earlier manifolds, Pierce makes the manifolds now, but the earlier manifolds, the Weber manifolds, had a, had a hose on them. And if you look at any Triumph manifold, I know this isn't a Triumph evening, but if you look at a Triumph intake manifold, aluminum manifold, they have a, the, heater, uh, the heater hose run through there not from the heater, not from the inside heater, but engine, so that the manifold always stays warm, so that doesn't happen quite so much. I'll propose to you that if you change to dual SU carburetors, that won't happen, because that gasoline doesn't drop out of suspension. But all that said, you wanna make sure you've got no vacuum leaks on the inlet. If you get a vacuum leak on the inlet, it'll cause all kinds of trouble and it can cause the problem that, you, that you're explaining now. So take a can of spray carburetor cleaner, you know, with that little red tube that sticks out of the end of it and spray between the, the uh, head and the manifold, the manifold, the heat shield, all that sort of an SU, but um, um, all around, any fittings that you've got. And if you can get the engine to change in speed, speed up, slow down, pretty dramatically, you've got a vacuum leak that is of consequence. Now, a pinhole leak makes no difference at 45 miles an hour, or 60 miles an hour, just none. But at idle, it can make all the difference in the world. So, and there's also stuff about jetting those, those D, uh, DGV carburetors that I don't know anything about. Uh, my my uh, associate, Carl Heidemann, in, at Eclectic Motor Works, said to me one day, he says, well, just buy, buy the jet kit, $1,500 with all the different jets in it. And then you got to put an O2 sensor uh, on your tailpipe, and then you've got to go out with your laptop and drive it and see what's going on with, with the mixture, um, and then be able to take all that and figure out what jet you should have. So anyway, it's, it's um, it might be that you've tried changing the mixture on, on that on that, that idle mixture with that trim screw back and forth and it doesn't seem to make okay. any difference. Yeah, yeah um, I, I have, but um, I had some, there someone- is, Mother had, had some- uh, I've got, here, uh, I'm gonna mute everybody again it's, because I got it's some- the other, some other. Sorry, Ned, you can un unmute yourself again. Sorry. Uh, okay, so I had someone, uh, work on the carb and he got it to a really good uh good mixture um so i didn't adjust those uh, the the speed screw or the idle mixture screw uh i just worked on the fast idle and just from working on that it helped stabilize it also the um the water choke was a little bit loose the last person who worked on it just didn't tighten everything down so i, I th there was the leak that was causing a much more erratic idle before Okay. So at least they've got it relatively stable. There is, um, I'm thinking that maybe um, the distributor needs a little bit of lubrication 
or maybe the uh, electrical contacts for the electronic ignition and the distributor and need a little bit of cleaning up. Because I noticed when, as soon as I clean up anything electrical, things function better. So I was, and I've been reading the Weber uh, carb books and I've been following some of their um, uh, advice. And um, I think I think it's helping. I'm just just wondering if you had experience. And I know you don't love the Webers, but it's, it's, it's what's on my car, you know? Hey, hey. you know, so the, the question is, even though I don't, even though I don't love them and make lots of fun of them, how can you make it run, run the best? And right. the first thing is to do is look, look for vacuum leaks. I mean, that's yeah. just, you do that anywhere, e even with, even with SUs. I mean, always yeah. look for vacuum leaks first, because if you got one of those, you can't tune through it. Um, I don't know how to make the manifold hot. Um, I don't know if you can find another manifold. Um, all, all this is an awful lot of work and you can always crank the idle up and up to yeah, 1100 it, it, and it may not be quite so offensive. Yeah, a thousand, uh, at a thousand RPMs, you don't, you don't notice it as much, if at all. But if I'm trying to like bring it down so it uses less gas, I'm going to try. I'm going to keep working on it and see um, how well I can get it to work. The heater pipe does dip below the uh, manifold. On the 76, it went underneath the old Stromberg mm -hmm. carb. So there is some heat there. And maybe I can attach it to the, the inlet manifold. And maybe that. Hey, I, that, you know, God made zip ties so that we, yep. we could use them on our MGs. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, try it. I mean, yep, try, try. I will. Thank you. Okay, Ned, thank you. And where, where are you calling from, Ned? New York City. I knew that, but nobody else yeah. did. So. Anyway, all right. Hey, thanks a lot, Ned. See ya. Thanks, John. Take okay. care. Okay, Steve Olson, you and Brittany should be careful with your necking. Steve, what is that even about? Um, Steve Stam, my starter failed in my 55 TF 1500, so the car is not currently running. You do have a starting handle, Steve. You can use the starting handle. In the meantime, none of the lights on the car, inside or outside, front or back, go on. There's plenty of juice in the battery, and the key is on, and both fuses are good. What could be wrong? Does the engine have to be running for the lights to go on? The car is brand new to me, so I've got a lot to learn. I've owned an MGA for 41 years and never experienced anything like this. So Steve, are you right there? Steve Stam? Your, so Steve, maybe- I'm here, John. I'm here, John. Okay, so the TF is the same as the MGA. Everything works the, the same. Um, and yes, the light should work. So you've got a headlight switch on the on the on the dashboard that that um, you pull out one one position and the parking light should go on and then you turn it slightly to the right and pull it to the second position just like the MGA and and the headlight should come on. So if they don't, the wiring goes from. Let me think about this for a minute. You've got a brown with blue, I think. And that goes from the control box to the to the headlight switch, and from the headlight switch, that brown with blue also goes up to the ignition switch, or maybe it goes to the ignition switch first and then goes down there. But you know, you can't see underneath that dash. I mean, not. I mean, if you're 18 years old and still weigh, you know, like 128 pounds, you could crawl underneath there, not only and see what's going on, but actually work on it. So now all you, all you can do is take a, a really good mirror and look and see. And once you get a view of what's going on, then reach up in there by, with your eyes closed, blind, and, and go for it. But the light should, should work whether the key, uh, the, key, the key and the engine running have nothing to do with the lights. The lights are totally independent of the, of the uh, ignition circuit. Yeah, well, nothing, none of the lights work. The panel lights, uh, you know, the low yeah. fuel indicator, none of that works. 
That, but that headlamp switch is towards the bottom of the instrument cluster, isn't it? Yes. Well, at least, at least it's towards the bottom. So with your 12 volt test light, yeah. you should, you know, ground the test light, test the test light, how, because what's hot underneath there right now, but um, use your 12 volt test light and just go from ground to uh, A, which is the, the um, hot connection on that switch. And then there's an S1 and an S2, switch one and switch two. Um, and the S, S1 is all red wires and those run the dash lights and go out to the corners of the car to light up the parking lights and the tail light or the uh, license light. And then S2 is a blue wire and that runs off to the dipper switch where it's either converted into blue with white for bright or blue with red for dip. So go to that ignition to go to the headlamp switch there should, and of course, if it's if it's a older car and it's fabric wiring, you can't tell what color the wire is. But just test all three of those terminals on that on that headlamp switch. One of them should be hot. If it's not, and it probably isn't, otherwise the lights would work. Then go to the ignition switch and see if that's hot on one side of it or the other. And if if it's not hot there, then go back to your A one position on the on the regulator on the control box on the left hand side of the of the car just above the above the fuse box so those are my comments well appreciate it john haven't seen you in years i go back to the eastern avenue days in the 80s yeah yeah you're from holland michigan yes and carl is all backed up so i can't get in to see him okay all right yeah steve has been a long long time that yeah. is for sure so Hey, is doing great. Wonderful. Wonderful. Hey, John, John, quick question on that. Yeah. Could I know on the MGBs, there's the three or four main ground areas, you know, for the grounding wires. Yes. Is that the same on the TF? And could that be if the ground is not, you know, if those grounded wires are not good, you know, maybe why all the lights aren't working? It might be because that might be the cause of a couple of lights not working, but not all of them. Okay. So they, cause they, they, they ground to the body. And when you got to, when everything doesn't work, I mean, is there a chance that every single light bulb in the car is, is, is blown out? Sure. But pretty rare. <laughs> uh, so the individual lights are all grounded at the, on, on the car. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks for Bill. Steve, it's a pleasure. Nice talking to you. Talk yeah. to you soon, I'm sure. Good so, to see you. Thank you. Mel Goldberg, turn signal gremlins. Working great for years. Over the weekend, the uh, right rear blinks fast, but not as bright as the left rear. Change the bulbs, front and back. Brake and running lights work. Checked and uh, checked for a good ground. Guess I should replace the flasher next, but no, you shouldn't. So anyway, um, Mel, you unmute yourself and come on and let's talk about your turn signals. We're waiting on Mel to unmute himself. Phil Ryan, I see you there. Pleasure to see you. Um, Mel, are you, are you on? I am. Uh, let me make, make sure. Uh, okay, gotcha. All right, so what right, you're- It's a 1957 MGA. Uh, okay. And I, uh, let's see, I painted it about three years ago and uh, took all of the uh, lamps off and the hoods and the, and the fenders and everything and put it all back together again and everything worked great until this past weekend. Okay. All of a sudden, it just, uh, it, uh, you know, my, my turn signal arm is getting kind of tired, so I need to fix this. Turn and using in the state of Michigan, hand signals are no longer recognized as as uh, legal. Someone told me that I can't believe it. I mean, when you know when, when you can be put in jail for feeding your horse a, a candy on Sunday in, in uh, I don't know Burnups. You know, I mean, they oh, they got all those ancient laws around that they every year they show up in the newspapers someplace. Um, 
anyway, I couldn't believe that hand signals, I, I still use hand signals in my MGA in heavy traffic, even though my turn signals work just great because help me out, I want someone to, what's he doing? At least, at least, at least it wakes him up. So the most common problem with the MGA uh, turn signals is browns. And um, if you've got, if, if the, left hand, the left hand turn comes on and winks okay. Uh, yeah, the left, left hand, front and back wink just fine. Okay, but the right hand, does the, does the front wink or not? Uh, the front does the same thing as the back uh, on the on the right side. It it kind of winks really fast and and not very strong. Okay, all right. So it could be there's a lot of possibilities, but it has to do with it's it's in one it's either the front or the rear, and it has to do with the ground or it has to do with a confused connection. So the easier place to go. This is fifty seven A. Correct. Yeah. Oh, the, the e easier place to go, just pull those bullet connectors out uh, of, the, of, the, of the little hoop that they're in, you know, the, right. the bullet connectors that have got the wires splayed through them, yes. and pull those out and just push them back, back in again. And of course, the ones you're going for uh, on the right front is green with white, and the one at the right rear is white with white with purples left. Oh, what's the one on the... Anyway, I don't, I, it's not the flasher because that's common to both sides. Uh, I, I don't think it's the turn signal box, which is, a, which is a double pull, double throw relay with eight wires attached up, up next to the brake master cylinder. Right. Um, I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem lies in, in one of your housings and you can't tell which one. So well, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't done the. Uh, I haven't pulled the front uh, housing apart, and I probably should do that. I did. I the first thing I did was I went to the back uh, right side, pulled the lens off, and uh, put a new bulb in, and then I uh, then I cl clamped on a ground, uh, and it didn't seem to do do anything. Uh, so I haven't really fully explored the front. So that that should probably be uh, my next thing then. Okay, all right, because that the turn signal flasher um, on, on the on the T types and the MGAs, if you lose for it, the, the front lamp is the one that you usually have the most trouble with, but um, when you lose that lamp up, up there, then the, the corresponding lamp at the back will wink like once or twice really rapidly, and then it seems to sort of flutter and nothing. I mean, it, it's there's not enough current passing through the the turn signal flasher to make it work. Now the, the great improvement, there are improvements. Remember there's form and there's function. So the form is that you've got the little Lucas can that's underneath that quarter inch um, Phillips screw right there in the center of the firewall behind the, behind the heater uh -huh. um, with the three wires attached to it. But you can go to Napa and you can buy an EL 13, I think it's not an EL 12 because that's the two. I think it's an EL 13, and it's got another use for a computer chip. Um, and and it doesn't matter if you got one one lamp or 15 lamps on the same circuit. It always winks at the same rate. It's a really really nice investment. So you're you, saying that uh, you're saying that that's that's not my issue. That that but that's not the issue. No, but I'm just saying that 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 it's a, it's a nice change to make. Sure. If you can suffer losing the form. So what I did is just leave the original turn signal in place so it looks like it's there. And then I took the three wires and, and put spades on those and put them on the flasher unit and that just sits behind the, the, the heater, the heater. So Barney, okay. Barney's usually on here, he'd, he'd weigh in, but he's off right now. Um, so uh, here's some oh, pictures on up the moment. Okay, so anyway, he, he he can't talk right now, but he's our MGA guru. He he'd weigh in on this too. But yeah, check check the front. So all right, cool, cool. Thank you, John. All right, okay. All right, David Stein is weighed in here, and thank you for your email. David Stein weighed in. He said, Hi John, the last time uh, the last time 
uh, before, we talked about a tech support letter that, that you sent to me um, to help me out in 1981. And David had bought a, a brand new MGB. It had a problem with a clutch. And, and I sent a letter and he was very kind. David, you found that letter and you sent it, you scanned it and sent it to me. Thank you very much. David's from the greater St. Louis area, or he was then. Are you on right now, David? Yeah, hey, John. Yeah, big surprise. I was actually looking for something else, um, but I uh, I stumbled across a, a file um, with a letter. I go, there it is. So I got really excited. I was in St. Louis back then because I went to college at Washington University, went from St. Louis to New York, and now I'm in San Diego. Uh, but I got a big kick out of finding the letter. And thanks again, because it was a big help when I first got the uh, B, which I still have uh, 40 years later. That was a long, that was a long time ago. I, I, it, it was only, only because of the stylized signature in the letterhead that, that they gave you any distance, probably. <laughs> so anyway, well, good. I'm glad. Glad that that worked out. And congratulations for owning your car for so long. And, and uh, what's the weather in, in San Diego? It's always uh, 70 degrees and sunny every day of the year, except for maybe three year, uh, three days where it rains, but it's uh, sunny and uh, sunny and 70 in San Diego. Great. Great. And perfect, uh, perfect weather for MGs. Great. Wonderful. Well, thanks very much. Thank you, John. All right. Now, our next one is from John, and I don't have a last name here. I don't know how to get these to, to display the, the full name. But it's about the 79 MGB with a, with a V8. Um, uh, what I notice in terms of improvement in ride and handling, what would I notice in terms of improvement in ride and handling by installing a, co a coil over front end? Um, how about that four link uh, rear like Bill Guzman produces? I have no experience with this at all. None, zero. I don't. I, I mean, you just have to go on MG Experience or talk to other guys who, who've done this. Um, but that th that that aluminum V8 weighs less than the original MGB engine does. I personally, I don't find anything wrong with the MGB steering or anything. I mean, that you can buy. Oh my gosh, you can buy a power steering attachment. You can buy electric windows. You can buy a supercharger. There's a lot of stuff. You five-speed Datsun gearboxes. There's all, I don't mean Datsun, uh, Nissan gearboxes. You can, you can buy all kinds of stuff for, for the car, but the way that it actually sits and handles is pretty nice just the way it is. You know, it's not a Jaguar. It, it, it doesn't, you know, it's, it hasn't got independent rear suspension and, and there's a lot more weight in the, in the suspension um, than other cars. Uh, you know, compare it to, uh, you know, again, a Jag or an Aston Martin or something, but it's not a Jag. It's not an Aston Martin. It's a lowly MG and it's tried and tested and it works great. But I don't know. I know there's a guy right, right down the road from us here uh, who sells a, a, a front end uh, that's uh, uh, some sort of coilover or something or other that's, that's pretty exotic. And, and you just have to have to call those places and say, hey, give me the name of somebody around where I live and let me talk to them directly. Of course, they're not gonna give you the name of someone who's upset. <laughs> give you the name of somebody who likes what, what they've got, but I, I have no experience, none, unless somebody else out, out here does. And John, you can unmute yourself uh, with the 79B with a V8. If you can unmute yourself on the bottom. Anybody else have, have any, any, yeah. any? I'm yeah. unmuted. Oh, okay. Oh, John yeah. Dykes. Yeah, okay. So, you know, I just, I don't have any experience with that. Where, where'd yeah. you get that V8 from? D&D? &D? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's a nice kit. Yeah, yeah. And Fast Cars put it in years and years ago. Okay. So it's, yeah. a, it's a Michigan product. And the guys, the Fast Cars, are still making that, I think still making that front end, right? Well, yes, uh, Seneca, uh, Seneca bought fast cars, right? And uh, they're they're doing. I guess they're doing what fast cars did, but their their specialty is making a coil over front end, and it's it's pretty pricey. I was mostly just thinking about would it feel more comfortable driving down the road 
hitting bumps. I mean, I'm not auto crossing the car. I'm not racing the car. Uh, it was, I was just curious, you know, the, the V8 guys are all, you know, they just throw money at the car. The cooler the car can be, the better it is. Whether it's an improvement or not, who knows? The V8 guys, there's no replacement for displacement. Yeah, that's it. Um, that's it. Are you gonna Are you gonna be a hot rodder with an MGB? You want to relive your high school years? Uh, you know, go if you want. You know, buy a old Mustang or a Corvette or something if you want to spin the rear wheels and, and be cool. You know, but I I I, I just I have no experience with, with that at all. And I um, there must be somebody around yeah. who's 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 had one. You know, who has one. So. But yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't even know who that is. I don't, I don't even know. I knew Ted Lathrop real well, um, you know, that, that did it. And Steve, um, his buddy Steve, who uh, does uh, the wiring, um, mm -hmm. um, he might he might know some people that have that on, on their on their cars. Yeah, well, the, the, the British V8 meet is down in Auburn next week. So okay. there'll be a chance maybe even to drive one around and see what it feels like. I have yeah. a feeling... I have a feeling it's not worth the uh, crazy money those uh, hot rod parts cost. Well, what is it, about five grand, isn't it? I think it's about five grand for the front end and probably 350 for the four link rear. Yeah. No, I, you know, I talk to people and say, I want to put disc brakes on the back of my MGB. And it's like, why? why? When, when was the last time you got them so hot that they wouldn't stop, you know? So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. You know, no matter what kind of motor you have, how fast are you really going to go unless you're on the track? Right. <laughs> true, true. And uh, Carl Heidemann um, did a, um, he, he wanted to find out how fast you could, you could burn up your brakes. And he did uh, um, zero to 60 to stop as fast as he could. And I think it was after a dozen times someplace in the city of Holland. I don't know where he was driving, um, but zero to 60 and then stop, you know, emergency, lock him up, stop, and then zero to 60. And he said, after about a dozen times of doing that, the brakes started to feel a little squishy. Well, if you drive like that, then you need better brakes. But um, most, <laughs> again, mo most of us don't. And I, I drove Lyle York's um, zero, um, his, the serial number on his factory GT was, uh, uh, 098, I think, or 097. So it was a pre-production MGB GT V8. And, and, oh my, I mean, I was just so impressed with the speed of that engine that, that the suspension didn't, didn't uh, bother me, but it's just got a regular, just a regular suspension. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's all about the sound. You want that V8 sound. That that's what's thrilling about it, and a little bit of torque. But you're not going to go much faster than about 80 or 85 anywhere you go, anyway. You can buy. I mean, for all the money it costs. I mean, the D and D. Um, for for those of you watch, watching, uh, D and D fabrications, D and D. Yeah. In Flint, Michigan, um, makes a kit with a, a V8 and. And, and the gearbox and the drive shaft and the speedo cable. It has every single part you need to, to pull your MG, your MG engine and gearbox out of your car and drop this V8 in. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful kit. 77 through 80, it's just a slam dunk. It's just easy schmeasy to do. You gotta take it to a muffler shop and have them, have them hook up the, the, ex, the exhaust. You're gonna cut holes in the in the inner fenders, but that's that's okay. I mean, it, it works just fine. But that kit runs about what ten grand now? Yeah, I don't know. This was a long time ago, but uh, it it comes with a Camaro five speed, you know. So it's a, a T five. It's uh it's it's sweet. The the shifter comes up just about in the same spot. Uh, it just feels like it was made. Well, it was made that way, just not on the Roadster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a there's this is a long sad story. I probably mentioned this before, but um, in 1973, you know, after Costello had started making this shoehorning the that Rover engine, which is really the Buick Skylark, that 215, um, into the 
into the MGBs, the factory said, well, we can do this. So they, 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 they designed them, started to put them into production, and they made these uh, about seven or eight pre-production cars and sent them to the directors of Jaguar Rover Triumph, 700 Willow Tree Lane, Leonia, New Jersey, and said, what do you think? You think we can sell these things? Well, remember that GRT, the, the, the sales arm for British Leyland, Jaguar Rover Triumph, didn't even include the name MG, despite the fact that MG sold, the, 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 the dollar value and the car value was over half, over half of their sales were from MG, and they didn't even get on the mark. So they brought them over and said, what do you think? Think we can sell them? They were faster than the Jags. And the guys at JRT and Leonia said, we won't sell them. So the official response from MG was, oh, my dear boy, uh, you know, if we'd started making them, the, the foundry could have never kept up. Give me a break. You know, or the other one was, oh, my dear boy, there was a gasoline crisis in your country at that time, and uh, no one wanted to buy a gas guzzler. If they'd made MGB GT V8s and brought them over to this country, the factory at Abingdon would still be in operation. They'd still be selling them. That is the nicest MG. <laughs> it's the fastest MG. It's not the fastest MG they ever made. That was a Metro, um, which is a post Abingdon car. But it's, oh my gosh, the engine's lighter than the, than the four speed. It's just sweet, sweet. And, and then surprisingly, Triumph came out with the TR8. Surprising. How oh, did that happen? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. Thanks a lot, John. It's a pleasure. And you're calling from? I'm in Chelsea, Michigan. Right. I knew where yeah. you were, but yeah. All right. And I've, I've got another question farther oh, down. Yeah. I'll just wait. Well, you go ahead. You're here. Well, let's see. What did I say? I don't even remember. Oh, I know my windshield wipers. So the car's got three windshield wipers. Right. They return perfectly the way they're supposed to when you turn them off. They, their, their right hand movement is perfectly fine. But when they come up, the one in front of the driver only goes to about the 11 o'clock position. In other, in other words, it doesn't sweep a whole 180 degrees across the windshield. But the other two do? No, the other two do, are, do exactly the same thing. Okay, so, so you take a look at the wiper motor on the right hand side of the dash. Yeah. And there's a three quarter inch gland nut. If that comes loose, then the motor is working and and moving the moving the cable some, but not all the way. So that's the most common reason that that happens is that three quarter inch gland nut has come loose from the from the rack. Okay. The okay. okay. Well, look. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next one up here. Next one, Sophia. When I push my clutch in on my 57A, the engine bogs down like it's under load. I assume this means my clutch release bearing is failing and needs to be replaced. Maybe, but easily, maybe not. Uh, Sophia, are you on or, or is someone on Sophia's computer tonight? Yes, uh, this is Larry on Sophia's mm -hmm. computer. All so right. My daughter, and this is her computer. Well, that's okay. I, you know, there, we have so very few. Every every time we're on, we got two or three women, but I didn't recognize Sophia, so I yeah. I, I figured it was you. <laughs> so <laughs> where, where are you calling from, Larry? Uh, all the way from Grand Rapids, Michigan, so not too far away. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. Okay. So, um the the um, the engine's producing just enough energy to overcome its internal resistance. Those two lines cross, and that's where your idle is. So your idle should be around 800 RPM. But if you've got a carbon release bearing, which most of them still have, pressing on the clutch doesn't put that much more drag on it. The only reason the engine slows down is if it's not tuned very well to start with. So that's where I would start on this is making sure that it's tuned well. And there are four factors in the tune up emissions, which are almost nil on an MGA, almost nil, the engine, the ignition, and the fuel. So 
How long have you had your MGA? Uh, just a couple of years. Picked it up about two years ago. You buy it from buy it here in town, or? Well, I bought it from a guy in Clawson, Michigan, uh, over north of Detroit. Okay. Uh, and it was his grandfather had purchased it originally. The guy I oh. bought it from, he um, he had had it for twenty years and put about eight hundred miles on it in twenty years. So uh, I, of course. Uh, my first year put 800 miles on it, and every single time I drove it, I had to fix something afterwards because it sat for too long. That's right. Yeah, you can't you can't lie in a chaise lounge and then suddenly jump up and start running. So yeah. Um, so the timing is should be at 32 degrees before top dead center, full mechanical advance, vacuum disconnected. That's a, that's a, there's just so many factors in here. You're so close that you can call me tomorrow and I can talk to you. Just a little bit more about it but i think it's the tune up first okay so usually when the clutch goes bad um you get you get trembling or vibration or chattering off the clutch pedal that's yep. an indicator that that there's a problem so okay i'm not getting any of that okay all right um you got my phone number i'm, I'm sure you can find it on my website speaking of my website I've been on on for uh, we've been on for a while now, so I got to make my pitch to go to my website. And while you're there, to get my phone number or any other reason, um, then you can look at that little yellow PayPal button and say, "I'm going to help John with his retirement." Thank you very much. Anyway, Larry, okay, call 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 me tomorrow. I'll, I can talk to you in great detail about this. All right, excellent. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, Alan, Alan has got a 72 MGB that I worked on. I think it has an ANSI exhaust. It sounds in my mind, just an English sports car should, just the right noise. So Alan, Alan Beecher, but which Alan is this? So the 72B. Alan, are you there, Alan? So ANSA. Those exhaust systems today, I don't know if you can still find them or not, but Moss dropped them out of their catalog because they got up to like, I don't know, six or 700 bucks for an exhaust system. And they said that, you know, they, they just, it wasn't worth putting them in, in the catalog. Nobody was buying them at that price. But oh my gosh. And ANSA, there used to be a, a couple different exhausts that you could buy back in the day, you know, ANSA, Stebro, Monza, but ANSA was always the best. Oh my gosh, they fit, they were great, and they sounded just beautiful. So the, the, my go-to exhaust now is Bell, B-E-L-L, -L. That's, that's the exhaust name, stainless. And it's, um, if I can still find an old Harmo, or original Harmo uh, silencer muffler for my MGA, I'd put that on because that's kind of more original sound to it. But um, Bell, Bell is a, is a really good name. So, anyway, okay, and I just went through John Dykeis again. Tom Weisel, any easy way to prop the window vents open while driving? They, clue, they close due to the wind velocity. Well, Tom, just drive more slowly. Tom, I'll do that. Maybe, yeah. <clears throat> hey, John. So, you're, you're talking about MGB vent windows? Yeah, 76, yep. Okay. Interior door panel comes off and then and then then you can reach up and and access the nylock, the quarter inch nylock nut that sits at the bottom of a very stiff spring gotcha. and you can tighten that nylock nut up and that will compress the spring and make it harder to turn the vent window. Now, if that nylock nut doesn't want to turn, which it very well may not because it's been rusted in place for all these years, um, then you've got to spray it down with some WD-40 or, um, you know, PB Blaster, XM, what's the stuff I use, XM100 or something. Um, but that's, that's the trick. There's a nut on the bottom. You've got to tighten up the, the, that nut and, and just put it under a greater load. Okay. I, I seem to remember that. I might have asked the question prematurely. Also, real quick, I put 80 or 90 weight uh, steering rack oil in recently, and I put new rubbers, boots on the ends. And then I, every time I park my car, I see the boots leaking. 
So do, do I have to change the seals on the end of the rack? Well, if the boots, the boots are leaking, that those are the seals at the end, end of the rack. Um, oh, that's the, that's the seal? Oh, the boots are the seal. Oh. So, so the most, most modern boots are sold as <laughs> zip ties. And you just zip them as tight as you can get them, and that usually cranks them down. I have, if you'll give, give me a moment here to look on my phone under messages, I, I want to let everybody know there, there's a better uh, rack boot that you can buy. They're not inexpensive. They're 30, 35 bucks a piece, but they'll last forever. It's a Ford, um, it's, a, it's a Ford part number. Oh, just a minute here. I bought generic ones, by the way. Okay, just a minute. I'm 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 having the hardest time here. I don't know why. Um, just a minute here. Let me just look. I'm, I'm, I want to give everybody this Napa part number because these rack boots, despite when we when I ran the shop, when I ran my shop, I didn't care what the part cost. I wanted the best part I could possibly find. Because if you put a part on and it fails, um, I mean, you're lucky when you're paid once to do a job, but only once can I remember getting paid twice to do the same job because of a faulty part. So if you're at Napa and you wanna buy rack boots for an MGB, the part number is 269-1507. 269-1507. That's a pack of two or pack, that's one? So I think that's a pack of one at 30, 30, <laughs> 35 bucks a piece. But even those come with um, zip ties. So if you okay. want to be Mr. Original, you know, you get the, you get the clamps <laughs> that go on there and t tighten them up and so forth. But zip ties, the function, the functionality of the zip ties is 100%. And, and is there a thicker is there a thicker slurry I could put in there instead of uh, ninety no, weight? No, no, you don't want anything thicker. If you get the, if you get zip ties snugging those things down on the on the larger and the smaller diameter around the rack housing and around the tie rod, no problem at all. It will not leak. Thank you, and John. <clears throat> is that part number for MGB? That's MGB. That's MGB. And I, I don't, an MGA, what's the, what's the difference, Barney, between a, the tie rod's a little bigger, is it on an MGA? It's a 5 eighths instead of 9 sixteenths, I think, maybe? Yeah, I think the outer end of the rack is a little larger on the B. Well, it very well might work, Barney. You want that number again? I got it, thanks. Okay. John. It's, a, it's a hole, it's a hole about the size of a pencil. You know, so you just put some grease on it and pull really, really hard until it go, goes up over the, the uh, tie rod. So, yes, Richard. John, can I have that part number again? Yes. Yep. Here we go. Here we go. Thanks to Mike, uh, Mike Blackport at uh, Rusty Moose Garage, who sent this to me on July 15th, 2019. And I keep going back to it. 269 dash 1507. Thank you. John, would that fit? Will it fit what, please? Uh, would that fit an MGB? MG, that is for an MGB, yes. I'm C, an M M oh. M C. Sure. What? Sure, it's the same, same uh, the rack housing and the tie rod are the same diameters. Great. Yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. Did you, say that, did you say that was a Napa part number? That's Napa, yes. John? Yes. Hi, this is Walter. Um, the, um, the gentleman was asking about the vent window. There is a company called Modern Motoring that is making um, 3D printed parts. And one of the things he makes is a little bracket to put on the vent window to hold it open. Okay, so that say say the name of the of the firm again. It's okay. Modern Motoring Limited. Modern Motoring M M L Modern Motor Modern Motoring Limited. 
Okay. Thank you. I was gonna I was gonna make a bracket. Yeah. That's neat. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, Oak. Now we got another one from um uh not from Sophia, from Larry. I think it's from Larry. Oil pressure on my MGA fifteen hundred. When I start it, the oil pressure gauge shows near zero. When I accelerate the engine, the pressure doesn't sweep upward. It lurches to 40 and then lurches to near 60. No smooth sweeping of the needle. That's kind of weird. The engine only has 25 miles on, 2,500 miles on it since a complete rebuild. And I replaced I replaced the oil pressure spring since, since this problem started. You know, the rule is that oil pressure gauges never go bad. That's the rule. That's the rule. But that jumping, that jumping is, is odd. There is a piece of, uh, on the look at your oil pressure gauge. There's a, a band of translucent blue plastic on the inside, and that can fall out of place, fall out of place and interfere with the movement of the needle. But oil pressure is like blood pressure. It must be correct. So you want to get another gauge on there and just see what's going on. When you're running, when you're, when you're running down the road, you should have 65 pounds of oil pressure. Absolutely. T-types, MGBs, not MGCs, those are a lot lower. That's around 35, 40. But on a B-series engine, you want about 65 pounds of pressure. Uh, and that's controlled by the oil pressure relief valve. That's the blow off. So if you don't have an oil pressure relief valve, you close it all the way down, which happens when you get the engine rebuilt and somebody puts a brass plug in the wrong place. Oil pressure will hit maybe 400, 400, 500 pounds per square inch before something catastrophic happens, like it blows the oil filter apart or blows an oil hose apart. Um, but you should be running down the road at 65. Now, what, what about hot idle? Um, on an August day when it's idling at 800 on the, on the, on the black tarmac in the Florida sun, what, what do you idle at, Barney? When you're when you're idling hot, you're down. You, you're almost always in Florida, it seems. What, what do you? Yeah, get? Uh, a normal idling? a normal hot engine, the engine in good condition should idle around 40. But if it's 100 degrees out and you just came off the expressway, maybe 30. Yeah. Okay. All right. So anyway, that's that's it. And I, I, you know, it really doesn't matter if it's down to 15, as long as the instant you tap the throttle it pops right up to the blow off point, okay? So anyway, again, I think it's Larry on, on his daughter's uh, computer. Talk, talk to me tomorrow some more about that. But oil pressure is really, really cri critical. Gosh, we rebuilt a guy's engine one time and the difference between a five main, um, the guts of a five main oil pump and the guts of a three main oil pump has to do with the length of the shaft of the of the rotor and at the time we were just buying kits they were made by county it was great you just bought a kit put it in the oil pump i don't think you can buy those anymore and i don't know our parts guy gave the mechanic the wrong part something happened anyway no problem drove around town great oil pressure guy i think guy drove it home um south of indianapolis someplace the next day he goes out starts the car up no oil pressure well, the engine was just re rebuilt, so he, he told me later, he says, I figured the oil pressure gauge was wrong. He said, no, oil pressure gauges don't, don't go bad. He had no oil pressure. So we got to build his engine again for free, and it was only because of that. But anyway, the point is, oil pressure gauges never go bad. There's exceptions to every rule I've got, but that, that rule is as is, is true as any other absolute rule. Once in a blue moon, there's a bad oil pressure gauge. It sort of sounds like that if it's if it's jumpy. So. Okay, Alan, my 67 TR4A and my 1968 MGC GT do not sound as cool. 
The TR4 has a new stainless steel exhaust. When you say drivability, I think of the sound my MGB makes. I wish the other cars sounded the same. Okay, drivability, okay. Yeah, you can't have an exhaust leak. I did not include that in my, in my list of drivability. I was just at Mark Brando's shop and, and he wanted me to touch the carburetors on a TC and they just, they just there was an exhaust leak right at the front pipe and it was just too horrible. And I, I said, I, 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 can't, I can't tune through this noise. I just, I can't, I can't make it sound pretty. So um, yes. Exhaust, nice exhausts are, are, are good. Okay, Bob and Gloria, saw you on before. Uh, how does one clean and or lube an MGB speedometer? When all five numbers roll over together, they hang up for about five miles. It just happened again when we went over 490,000 miles. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I don't know anything about the in, inside of the speedos. I, 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 I had the guys working for me that could easily reset the speedo to whatever number you wanted. And they probably also knew how to lube them. But uh, anytime you fiddle around and start touching the inside of that, a drop of oil or your thumbprint's going to get on one of those numbers. And I tell you, those, those numbers are, are uh, like chalky. And, and it's really easy to smear, you know, so it ends up that it rolls around. And if it's, if it's on a, if it's on a, a mile, um, mile wheel, then it just bugs you once every 10 miles. But if it's on the hundred wheel or something or other, then it's going to bug you for the whole hundred miles that it's on there to see the number five or the number eight kind of smeared. But it probably just has to do with lubrication. Um, I I have, um, somebody gave me this. I don't know if you can see that. It's um, called dry film lubricant. And I didn't know if, because I don't, I don't want to put any lubricant on because it, well, everything grabbed, gathers dust and that makes it worse. But this says dry film lubricant. I don't know if you ever heard of that. I have not, but you could call, of course, Peter, Peter at Nisinger. You could call Peter at Nisinger Instruments, or you could call, I think it's Carlos, at um, oh, Albuquerque, MoMA, uh, or you could call um, Morris at West Valley Instruments and just go, hey, I know, dude, I know I should send it to you and spend 200 bucks, but since I, I'm at the beginning of my driving season and since you're backed up three weeks or six weeks, you know, I, I'm going to miss putting another, you know, 18,000 miles on my car based on how much you guys drive your car. Um, <laughs> well, well it's, it's in for repair. How, how can I do it? So those are the, those are the three rebuild. There's some other people around that re rebuild them, but I, I don't know. Well, what, what I, what I do every 10,000 miles, I take the speedometer out and move it up to where I know I've lost five miles and, it's kind of a pain, but in fact, it's not bad for me because it's Gloria that puts her hand up there and loosens it up, takes it out. So, and it only the speedometer. I um, I lose just over a mile for every hundred miles, so one percent. That's that's, that's pretty. Bad. That's pretty close. That's pretty close. And that that you could you could you. I don't think you could ask to have it corrected. You know, if you're going to send it in and have it fixed, I don't think you could get closer than that. Probably a mile on every hundred. Yeah, that's 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 pretty close. That's pretty close up. And of course, the reason it's not doing that is because the tires on the back of the car are not the same as the speedometer expects them to be. So, yeah, I've got one ninety five sixty fifteens, and they're a little bit taller, not much, but just enough taller. And I have to uh, use my cruise control to make sure that I don't get a ticket. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. But I, do, I, I don't know much about speedos. <clears throat> so. uh, well, I, I thought I'd ask. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay. I really appreciate uh, uh, on oh, your new videos. I want to tell you the new videos are great. I, I love hey, them. So I, I, I want to read you some of the real early ones. Uh, my number one video um, was in Mark Mauser's MG Midget. He's a, a work for a, a, a company in New York City that installed fire suppression 
systems and he drove the midget out to the shop. Um, and I, I think, as I remember, and we did a whole, whole lot of stuff on it. And I, I just come off a, uh, another phone call on the, my, my Fulton Street address where someone asked me how to pop the steering wheel off a MG. And I, I was walking out in the shop and, and I, I just had answered this question so many times on the phone. And Andrew Capone, one of my high school kids was standing there. And, and I looked at him, I said, Capone, I said, I've got a video camera. If, if, you, if you took a video of me showing how to pop a steering wheel off, off a car, do you, would you know how to put that on YouTube? And he said, duh. So <laughs> that, that's where it started, you know? We, we started with, with a bang and we did, I did a whole lot of videos and then they got kind of spotty. And then uh, after Caroline passed away and then, and then um, uh, after my son James died, I, I just, you know, it, I got these gaps. But, I got this cool guy now, Max. And he's just does such a such a tremendous job. They're, so, they're excellent. They are. Thanks. Thanks. Keep up the good work. And you're calling from? Uh, Strongsville, Ohio, outside of Cleveland. Okay. All right. Emerald Necklace MG Club. Well, thanks. All right. I'm going to mute everybody again just to make sure everybody's muted, not because I don't like you, but just cut back on the background noise. Ben Andrews. John, do you have a video on the MGB door latch refurbishment? Um, solving when the, the latching claw is a bit sluggish and door adjustment. Also, is there a way to shim or adjust the push button handle trigger um, uh, for the opening? Uh, the inside door handle works fine. So this is all really frustrating because you can't you can't have the rear track or the glass in place when you're in there. You can't. We used to do that, but oh my gosh, one of our guys had a wrench that was uh, he had a little tiny five sixteenths wrench. Actually, the nuts holding the the um, uh, outside door handle on are two BA British Association. Fortunately, a five sixteenths wrench fits. But any 5 16 wrench that you buy is about that long. So he welded a piece of welding rod onto it and made it about a foot long. And he could reach down inside the door and make these adjustments. The push button itself, that's a 3 8 nut. That's a, again, but again, how long is your 3 8 wrench? Only that long and you got to get longer. So the first thing that I'd tell you is oil. Oil, 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 oil the door latches. Just oil them, oil them, oil them until they just drip with oil. Put a, a couple of rags on the floor to, to catch it. Be sure to wipe off the door jam afterwards so when your passenger gets in, they don't get um, a whole lot of oil on the back of their skirt or something. You know, that, that's always problems. Anyway, oil it and that makes it work. <clears throat> just great. I mean, just right, just right there. It's hundred percent better. But if the push button isn't pushing at the right time, there is a, a screw and a, and a, and a stop nut on that, that you can adjust in place, but you now you need two three eighths wrenches that are, you know, let me get in the view here that long. Um, it's really hard to do in, in place. If the, if the window glass is out, it's really easy. Taking the window glass out is real is a real bugger. If you haven't done it in a long time, you know you take get the glass out and that takes you you know like an hour, and then you go to put it back in, and that's an hour. If you go to do the other door right afterwards, it only takes ten minutes because you got the technique. Um, but those are the, the anything inside the door at the rear of the door is tedious just because there's a lot of stuff in place. But first of all, Ben oil it and then and then again you can use a pair of of three eighths wrenches to adjust that the bolt that comes in the bright light you can look down in there and see what's going on make sure that those quarter inch flathead screws holding the latch onto the door are tight 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 because uh, once they start to come loose then it wreaks havoc with the with the weld nuts on the inside of the door skin and those will eventually strip out. So one of those this past weekend. So is there a way to, to uh, uh, shimmer adjust the push button? That, I've explained that. So anyway, Ben, where, where are you? Are you on right now? 
Ben Andrews with the MGC. Anyway, Ben's from, uh, oh, I want to say Valparaiso, but that isn't quite right, but it's down, down by, by there. From Dennis to everyone about drivability, does anyone have any experience with putting the lowering springs on the later cars? Does this improve the handling or is this a bad idea? This, this will get about as much interest as voting on whether we should do our next one at eight o'clock. So my personal belief is that by changing the springs in the car, you change the geometry of the front wheels, you change, you change the camber, uh, so it isn't gonna drive as well as, as it was designed to drive. If you want a lowered car, buy a lowered car. Why would you buy a rubber bumper car and put chrome bumpers on it? Because chrome bumper cars are too expensive, they're harder to find. I just saw one this past weekend, beautiful job, beautiful job. Um, doing it, except one of the front lamps was loose and had lost its ground and the turn signals weren't, weren't working. Um, but I, I have seen, I have seen it's a really expensive proposition to do after you buy the whole kit, the lowering kit and the chrome bumpers and stuff like that. Um, it's, uh, you gotta have body work done. It's, it's, it's a big, big project. Just go out and buy, find yourself a nice chrome bumper car. Personally, I like the raised ride height. 77 through 80 is just as nice as the MGB's got. Oh no, I can't stand those ugly, ugly rubber bumpers. Okay, so you get a 73 through 74. That's as nice as the chrome bumper cars got. But 77 through 80, you got a front anti-sway bar, a rear anti-sway bar. The car's up. You don't have to squat down quite so much to get into it. Lisa, working the front counter, had a guy call her up one time from down south, some good, good old boy. He says, you know, I can't get out of that car. I gotta, I, I gotta, I gotta roll out. <laughs> so, you know, the higher the car, it, it's uh, in our advanced ages, the easier it is. Now, that all said, that, so that it's, it's like, they are to me like wherever carburetors. I, I, I don't like them, but if you wanna do it, I can tell you what to do and so forth. I don't think it improves the handling. So anyway, I'm interested in talking to Dennis or anyone else who's done this and, and um, let's get a, a different view than mine. Dennis, are you there? Dennis isn't there. How about anybody else? Has anybody else lowered the car? You like it? You happy you did it? I've done it pretty extensively to my 77. I started with the uh, standard lowering kit from, from Moss, which takes you down about an inch and uh, put one inch lowering blocks in the rear. Uh, I was really happy with that. It, it, I found it didn't really impact the drivability of the car in any negative way at all. I, I did it because I was trying to lower the roll center of the car and get it to grip a little better. Um, and then I, then after that, I went arguably much too far <laughs> <laughs> because, because I do track the car. And uh, so now I've gone as low as any human would want. So now, I, now I've got the 600 pound race springs in the front and the reverse eye springs in the back. So the car is very low. Uh, and now I have trouble with speed bumps. So, you know. There is that, don't go too low because it, it makes it hard to drive around and speed bumps become a problem. Uh, talk, talk to anybody who's got an Austin Healey 3000 and if your friend's got an angle driveway or up or up, there's a speed bump on, on the way there, you don't have an exhaust at the end of it. So. Yeah. yeah, you hear a lot about uh, bump steer. If you just drop it and the, the control arms go up. Um, but in, in my experience, I haven't, experience a uh, bump steer as a problem you know I, I keep my hand on the steering wheel most of the time <laughs> so not been a problem okay well that's brad's weighed in on it he's had great luck but then he got too excited no good deed goes unpunished has anybody else lowered the car 
Oh, so, so there, that's, oh, Rich, you're going to weigh in? Sorry, I would just add one thing. When I, when I did lower the car, um, and because I do some autocrossing, it was really obvious to find what, how that changed the dynamic of, of oversteer, understeer. And I had to remove the rear sway bar. Had really? to take it out. Really? Yeah. The second, if you left it in, the back end gets very, very happy. <laughs> it'll it'll the back end will go around on you in a hurry if you leave the rear sway bar in okay if you've lowered the car okay i don't have an awful lot of experience having done that that that's that uh, i closed my shop big time in in 2010 29 2009 and then uh, again in 16 figured i didn't close it right the first time so i had to close it again and uh we just never got involved with that. Just didn't get asked. To, if somebody had asked us to do it, we would. I would have tried to talk them out of it, of course. But then, once they went on, we did. We did one. We did one in in about nineteen. Oh my gosh, seventy eight, and it was on a seventy six MGB that had neither a front nor a rear anti sway bar, and um, we had a lot, a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble with torque steering and everything else but okay now we're gonna go to Rodolfo you can unmute yourself here Rodolfo from Monterey hello everybody hey welcome 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 thank you what what time is it there are you on uh, like cent central US time yes it's a uh, seven uh, quarter to eight yep yep okay okay so Rodolfo writes in and says he, the third gear of his MGB three synchro non overdrive pops out sometimes when the deceleration is long, never on acceleration. Any thoughts? So does my MGA, and it's got a three synchro gearbox in it. Barney, Barney, why do these things drop? Drop? You know, I don't see Barney on, on my screen, but Barney's probably still here. Barney, why, why do these things drop out of third gear? Yeah, I'm here. It's, my picture's not up there. Uh, third, third gear dropout in MGAs, at least, uh, halfway through production. Well-known problem from the factory. They've got okay. a gear specified in the workshop manual. Basically, you grind a detent a little deeper, and you put a slightly stronger spring in it. And that's supposed to cure it. Okay, so that only requires that Rodolfo removes his gearbox from his car, takes the only whole, <laughs> yeah. whole gearbox apart. Yeah, okay. so that's um, all very simple. You just pull the engine of transmission out and disassemble the gearbox, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I that happens on my MGA too, and on it happens on later MGBs, um, seventy-seven through eighty, especially because the, the gear lever boot is too short and you push the gear lever forward and it stresses stresses the gear lever boot and the boot all the time is pulling back pulling back on, on the gear lever so i always tell people well if this is a really chronic situation it's happening a lot that's what i mean by chronic take okay. take the, the the screws out from around there just take, take that rubber boot off and try it. does this still happen if it doesn't, duh, it's the boot. But if it still does, you just have to suffer it until the next time the gearbox is apart. So um, Bernie says there's a, there's a fix for it in the uh, uh, in the workshop manual. But there's a there's a shaft, you know, there's a shaft, and the shaft has a scoop out, yeah. out and there's a, a pin that go, goes into that. It's a column with a hemisphere up on the end and spring on on top of that. So you slide this thing in and that thing sits in. Um, it all has to do with the main shaft being too far, third gear, uh, too far to the rear. If the main shaft was a little bit farther forward, then, the, then it wouldn't pop out of gear probably, but that's a lot more complicated. And as soon as you start fiddling with that, uh, then you're fiddling with first and second gear also. So. So it's it's okay. um, uh, on T types on T types um, first gear. I was just in one this weekend, and I said, "Oh, it's got a walking first gear." The guy goes, "What's that?" And I said, "As you're accelerating, 
the gear lever slowly comes back and then goes bang and it pops out, out of gear. And there's a, there's a really handy fix for doing T-type um, gears. And again, it has to do with putting a double detent in it instead of just one, you put two in it. Um, so okay. <laughs> no, easy, no easy solutions to this. Yes, uh, I also always from the second gear to the third gear, uh, it always uh, sounds like a spring. Uh, a little uh, tune sound. Uh, I have a video, but I, I want to experiment. If you can hear it, it's only five seconds. The, 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 if you can listen to it. Sure, you can try. Okay, I hope. Uh, watch out your ears, everybody. <laughs> I don't know if, if it is going to be too loud. It's really, really fast. On the first and ten, uh, second, it's the, the change. I think you miss it. It, it, it is it's uh, very, very difficult to do any diagnosis over, a, over any. I used to have people call me and they'd say, well, listen, you know, they put the phone up by their engine and say, listen, you know, and it, it can't, you just can't hear anything except clatter. I'm going um, to send you the, the, the five second clip on your email, maybe. Uh, it's okay. Really clear. Yeah, that's, that's the, the okay. thing. Okay. Um, you, if it's a synchronizer, it, say for instance, the third gear synchronizer is faulty and it goes when you're changing up from second to third, yeah. then when you're changing from, from down from fourth to third, it's always worse there, always worse because okay. of the way that we tend to drive. And, and uh, so, but it doesn't make any noise going from fourth to third? Nope, it or doesn't, that? only from second to third. That's interesting, okay. Okay, thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Nice to see you again. Pleasure, always a pleasure. So, all right, from iPad 6 to, to, uh, to everyone, um, are you in, attending the Atlantic City MG meet? Yes, I am. I'll be there. I'm, I'm not sure how I'm getting there. I was gonna, I was gonna drive, but no, my daughter's gonna be here. Maybe I'm gonna fly, I don't know. I'm doing a couple of seminars, so. Anyway, that's, uh, you can go on MG2021. They, they got a nice website. Go there for the day, go there for an afternoon, go there for all five days. I mean, this is the, this is the five year all register meet. That's the triple M's, midgets, magnets, and magnets. Uh, the T series register, the MGB register, um, uh, the MGC register is is got their own event because that that there's still a problem with a breakup between those two clubs. The midgets are with those, and who am I missing? MG 1100, those those are with the M MGB group. Namgar, that's what I was missing. The M MGA group. So anyway, the last one that we had was in Louisville, and that had maybe 800 cars, and it was about 800 degrees underneath those those trestles those bridges, oh my gosh, it was hot. But not as, I don't think as hot as MG96 was. Um, the, next, the next event after that, it happens once every five years. And the reason that this thing even happens, happens is because in 1992, well, maybe, the MG Car Club, uh, led by, the name will come to me in a moment, um, sent their emissary, Phil Richer, who had previously been the twin cam registrar for the MG Car Club England. Uh, uh, Corey, Will Corey, was the head of the MG Car Club. And they kept saying that they wanted to bring the MG clubs in the United States closer in to the, to the, to the, home, to the home club. Made every sense to me. So they said, oh, we're going to support you guys and help out and yada, yada, yada. Well, then it came, it came to pass. Phil Richard came here and he started going from club to club to club to form up yet another national club that had tighter ties with the MG Car Club England. And um, some of us still have our, our uh, T-shirts that say uh, MG Car Club North America launch date. I mean, it was a... 
it was a great, it was a campaign that they had. Well, everybody got territorial and said, not in my backyard, we don't need another national club. And, and some people actually sent tea bags to the MG Car Club in England, reminiscent of the Boston Tea Party. And, and uh, they, they were, they withdrew, they withdrew. But as a result of all the registers forming together in opposition to a British takeover, out of that came MG96, which is the first all register meet at Indianapolis. I was the chairman. And we had, I don't know, you can't be sure when you, the numbers are as great as they were. And it was out in 1200, 1400, someplace in there, MGs. So that, that was quite an event. We filled hotel after hotel. We had, we were on the track at Indianapolis. That was the event. After that was uh, Minneapolis. We we're gonna have it in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, but the guy that was charged with organizing it um, didn't follow what the, re what the registers wanted. So he got fired and, and at the last minute was moved to Minneapolis, which was equidistantly distant for everyone. And then I think after that was Gatlinburg. And then after that was, what did I, what did I miss here? And after that was uh, um, St. Louis, uh, not St. Louis. Uh, Reno. Uh, Reno, yes, that was 2011, Reno. So I usually go in and do, thank you. Uh, I usually do my, um, Doug, um, how many people did, did we have here tonight? I, we're down to 127. We're, we're at two, two, uh, two hours here. Uh, high water mark was 157. Hey, okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I usually do my technical, uh, my rolling road tech, and they had me on the third floor in the parking ramp. So any car that didn't run well enough to get up to the third floor in the parking ramp, I didn't have to look at. So that was, anyway. yes, Reno, Reno. And then, and then um, uh, Louisville, and now we're in Atlantic City. So anyway, anyway. A lot of comment there about, about that. All right, here we go. Here's another real one. Um, from Anthony, we have a 66 MGB and just got it running um, after 12 years of sitting around. The tack and the horn are not working. 66B, it's an electric tack. Um, what are the two terminals, CB and SW, on the ignition coil? Could I have messed up my tack by reversing polarity? Our car was positive earth, but but is negative earth and has been for 40 years. So let's start with the ignition coil because that's easy. CB is contact breaker. So hook that to the white with black that goes to the distributor. SW on the coil is for switch that goes to the hot lead, the white wire. So white to SW for switch, the wire that goes to the coil, which should be white with black, um, is, is uh, the CB for contact breaker. From 1965 till 1967, the tachometers were wired for positive earth. They will not work on negative earth. It's a transistorized unit made by Texas Instruments. 1968, every, everything became negative earth. So it's easy enough to switch a tachometer from positive to negative earth. You gotta take it apart. You gotta do some soldering. You gotta recalibrate it. If you don't wanna do all that, you can send it out and have it fixed. Plus you gotta reverse the connections on the impulse loop on the back. But it may be that the reason that the tach doesn't work is because you are negative earth. Now there's no reason to be negative earth. There's nothing magic about positive or negative earth unless you have a radio. And you don't want to fiddle around with a radio, trying to put up a negative earth radio into a positive earth car, um, because if you get a short, zzz, there goes the radio and, and uh, that's more expensive to replace than something else. So you can, um, you can call me tomorrow. I, I, I'll talk to you more about it, but um, uh, you, you can send that tech out to Nysinger Instruments or Morris at West Valley Instruments in the better part of San Francisco, someplace out there, um, and, and get it converted over to 
negative ground, or you can just have the uh, yes, you 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 can do that. They'll they'll probably put in a, a modern guts anyway, and and ask you to add a, another wire to go down to the coil to the CB terminal. But anyway, um, that's that's the scoop. There's something else that wasn't working there. The horn. The horn is here. West, West Valley is actually a little north of uh, the LA airport. Oh, all right. Okay. Los Angeles. All right. Okay. Riverside? Where, where, where is it? Um, no, it's sort of just about north, north, uh, west of LA airport, about 20 miles. Okay. All right. All right. Um, Morris runs that. Morris and Margaret were in partnership for a while in Albuquerque at MoMA. MO for Morris, MA for Margaret. Neither of them are there anymore. Margaret's passed away. And Carlos, I think, works there or runs the runs that place now. But anyway, yeah, Morris is there. And, and Peter, uh, I can't remember Peter's last name, is it Nicinger Instruments in Mamaroneck, New York, spelled Mama Ronek. M-A-M-A-R-O-N-E-C. Anyway, um, and the only reason the horn wouldn't work, I got to mute everybody here for a minute because I got some background noise, not because I don't like it, but um, all right. So um, only if the horns were air horns and it had a compressor on it. Otherwise, horns are, are bisexual. They'll work plus or minus. It doesn't make any difference at all. It could be that, that, that they're just old. So anyway, that's my, those are my comments for Anthony, who did not unmute himself during that whole time. Oh, anyway, Adams to everybody. Hi, John. Can an effective cruise control be added to my PTA? I'm going to mute everybody again. Sorry. I got some there we go. Um, so um, can an effective cruise control be added to my MGA? Absolutely. Barney. Barney's got one. You can go on Barney's site mgaguru.com mgaguru.com and Barney, Bar Barney must Barney puts thousands of miles on his MGA every day so he must have cruise control um, yes, so yes and no <laughs> no you I don't first, I first installed cruise control in 1989 and in those days they were all vacuum powered units and they don't work very well on these little four cylinder engines because when you hit the gas pedal, the vacuum goes away. And they really don't work at high altitudes, anything more than a few thousand feet. And I had so much trouble with them, I finally just took the thing off. But now they have electronic cruise controls that don't have vacuum, and those things just work like a charm. You have mount it somewhere, you put the little pull on the throttle link, you hook up a few wires and you can hook it to the ignition coil for the speed sensor if you got a stick shift, not an automatic. And they just work beautiful. And you, you must have, you've got some instructions on that on your website? Yeah, I got cruise control instructions, but the ones I got probably apply to the vacuum units. Oh, okay, all right. So it, they're, they're all real easy to install. The instructions come with them. You just bolt them on someplace where the cable will reach to your throttle link. They give you a little bracket with it, and there's a few wires, and that's it. Okay. Yeah, so I, I have a vacuum, uh, one, an older one that works on vacuum, and I got an extra vacuum tank and put it on, and it works fine. It works like a factory cruise. Okay. But you got uh, an extra vacuum tank. That works. They also work better if you put a vacuum reservoir on it, something about the size of a softball for a vacuum canister. Yeah. But if you get into the mountains and you're going uphill and it needs to modulate it constantly going uphill, the vacuum canister very suddenly goes dry on vacuum. Okay, so anyway, the new ones, the modern ones, the electronic ones, Barney says are great, easy to install. He, they're so simple, he doesn't even have instructions on his website how to do it because it's so straightforward. And the instructions that come with it are, are wonderfully... Um, wonderfully adequate, unlike the um, air condition instructions that I got for putting air condition in, in a 73 BGT, I, I think I'm gonna offer to rewrite their instructions for them um, when, when I'm done here, so. All right, let's see. The next one up, will Atlantic City have a section where one could sell an MGB? Don't know, but a for sale sign in the window is, an effective thing. So 
you, you could go there. Although I wouldn't go there to sell the car. Um, first of all, you, you're going to encounter just a little bit of harassment uh, for abandoning the, 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 the mark. And it'd be cheaper and easier just to put it on Craigslist, Hemmings.com, bring a trailer, one of those places. From Jim, what can I expect from a restoration shop like Eclectic wanting them to accept my car for restoration? Do I have to drop your name or grease someone's palm? So Jim, you're trying to get your car into, into Carl at Eclectic? And they yes, are, I like, yeah, I, I got a 59A. Oh my gosh, no, everybody's backed up. I was talking to um, Glenn at Glenn's MG Service in St. Petersburg, Florida. And he said his, his waiting list has got 20 names on it. He said, I'll be dead. Hell, they'll be dead by the time I, uh, I get halfway through, through the list. So um, right now it's just bonkers because of, because of COVID. So it's, um, you know, and, and you're, not, you're not prepared to, to do this kind of work yourself. You know, if, is it an MGA? Yes, it's an A. Well, Paul Deershaw, I, he's got a list too. Of, of, he's, I walked into a machine shop Oh, I don't know, four weeks ago, maybe to get some spacers made for my daughter's car to, um, to so it, it would accept um, a wire wheel diff would accept um, disc wheels. And the guy kind of knew who I was. And I walked in, I didn't even say anything. And he said, you want a job? And that's, that's what Paul Deershaw will ask you too, when you call him at Sports Car Craftsman in Denver. Colorado. He does a lot of MGs. Where, where are you calling from, Jim? Beaufort, South Carolina. Okay. Um, I, I know. I know. Glenn's just jammed. I mean, Glenn's just jammed in in St. Pete. He's a lot closer to you. But once you put it on a truck, what differences make where it goes? So yeah. you call Paul Deershaw, sports car craftsman, Arvada, Colorado. Okay. Um, and chances are he's back. Everybody's backed up. It's just you know so. Uh, so then you say, well, you know what? I'm going to make this a pro my own project, um, but that requires you know a place to do it and and a lot of work. I mean, if you're going to, you know, I mean, I'm not suggesting you do the body work, but because that's that's the tricky part, um, uh, especially on an A. There's no no British car that's more complicated than an MGA to to. Uh, Restore it. And MGA's got curves in places. Most cars don't have places. <laughs> Get through some. Uh, I've seen it. So anyway, yes. Um, drop me a note. Look, let me think some more about this, Jim, or call me or something, and, and we'll talk about it. And and uh, I I just don't know anybody in the East Coast. I just don't I don't know. I mean, and even, even if you get a checkbook out and say, look, look, I'll give you fifty grand down. You know, everyone's busy. It's just, it's just a, it's a weird time for all, yeah, yeah. For, for all the um, businesses that they are closed up. I just went through the Minneapolis airport, Northwest, Northwest, not North, are they Northwest? No, they're Delta, uh, their hub. Um, I was going to call them Northwest Orient. It's like, wait, I know that's, I know that's dated. Lots and lots of shops closed up. So for all those shops that closed up, Every restoration shop, not just MG Place, every restoration shop is just gangbusters with yeah, people yeah. wanting to have stuff done. It's all this money that's been, oh, oh, anyway, now I'm getting political. So, anyway. All right, John. Uh, talk, talk to me again, Jim, and, and just see what, uh, what, what else I, I, can, I can think of. So. Okay. Thank you, John. Right. From Greg Fast, um, L547. But referenced in my SU rebuilding video is only available from Grand Rapids location of Grand Northern Products. They do ship, um, and and uh, um, Greg Fast here has had a discussion, but I think they only ship five gallon pails. So uh, unless you're like, it's like I don't care what it costs, but if you haven't seen my YouTube video about rebuilding SU carburetors. Take a look at it. It's just, it's 
gone up in the past two weeks or so. I show you this MG, this body, and it really, it looks like fresh cast. I mean, it's just so beautiful. I know there's lots of different ways that people do, that people prepare uh, bodies. Um, but boy, I, I'll, I'll go for my, my method anytime. So Greg, are, are you on? Yes, sir, I am. Okay. So anyway, but that, that's what you found out talking. Did you talk to me last week about this? No, I didn't. I, oh. I was, after, after last week I, or last meeting, I, I uh, took a look at the uh, YouTube. I looked through your YouTube videos and, and saw this one was fairly fresh. And so I, I looked at it and it was like, you seem kind of uh, uh, unsure about where, where, whether 547 was a, a proprietary mixture or, uh, and, and it turns out it is proprietary. Uh, there are three Grand Northern locations, uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, someplace in Wisconsin and Grand Rapids. Okay. And, but they only stock the, uh, and you're right, five gallon pails um, um, out of uh, Grand Rapids, they do ship. It, uh, the, the raw cost was about 13 bucks a gallon. So it's 65 bucks to, for a, a pail plus shipping or that kind of number. Sort of like shopping at Costco. Like, you know, I like strawberries, but I, I don't need half a pallet of them, you know? You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, here's a, here's a cottage business. Somebody can buy a, buy a five gallon pail of, of uh, L547 and, and send it out in, because all you need in there is like, you know, a quarter of a cup or something. Um, I'm pretty liberal with it when I use it because I still got a five gallon pail and I, I don't know if I'm gonna go through it by the time I'm done, you know, doing MG stuff. But yeah, your cottage business, anybody who wants to uh, get it, 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 there's probably other stuff out there too, but it's, it's um, it, we found it is just great for polishing aluminum. Anything else you put in there just turns the aluminum black. So this stuff's great. So. Where, where are you from, Greg? Leavenworth, Washington. Okay. So you don't, you can drive right down the street. Would you say there's some place right there, in Seattle or someplace you can buy it? Uh, Portland, but no, no, they, it, it's not it's not stocked in Portland. It's only oh. stocked in Grand Rapids, and uh, so they they will they'll they'll ship direct to me, but. Uh, or direct to Pete to an individual, but it, it there, it's only stocked in, in Grand Rapids. Okay. Okie doke, Greg, thank you very much. Okay, from Randy Shock, Randy's on. Randy, is there an automatic transmission for an MGB? And we're back to Paul Deershaw at Sports Car Craftsman in Arvada, Colorado, who three years ago, was doing a lot of development to get, I, I don't know what kind of automatic transmission to made up with an MGB. He wasn't funding the, the development, his customer was, and I found not mistaken, his customer passed away. So development stopped, not because there isn't a market, but because so many people want their MGAs restored that he's busy all the time. So, I don't know of one. You know, the Austin Marina, sold here as an Austin Marina, sold as a Morris Marina in England, but the Austin Marina had an automatic gearbox. Skip Harris in Arkansas would have a line on those automatics. I mean, there, there were a lot of Austin Marinas around with automatics, and it's bolted up to an MGB engine, slam dunk, but most of the Austin Marinas are long, long, long since re recycled and come back as Toyotas or something. So um, I don't know of any other one. Does anybody else here know of any automatic? No? I know there's a market for it. Hey, John. Yeah. I heard that there's an older Volvo transmission that could be made it up. I'm not sure, it's just something I heard. This is also for a handicapped person or sure. perhaps my wife who will drive an automatic. There's, you know, it's crazy. It's, the, I already already went through my explanation of how crazy it was that, that they did not make an MGB GT V8. Um, so they did make an MGB automatic. Uh, Terry Luft 
in Ohio has one, right hand drive, but they only made them for the home market, England. Nobody drives an automatic in England, even still half the cars are stick, even today. So why didn't they bring the automatic here? Who knows? They never, they never understood our market. But there, there is a, there is an automatic, but it's the same automatic that they use on the MGC, and it's it weighs about two thousand pounds. It's real luggy. I, I, that's the way that I want to say it. Uh, you've, you've driven an automatic C. You know, you got your foot on the brake, and you can't, you can't. <laughs> You can't let your mind wander because your that brake pedal has to be pushed hard because that thing will tug, tug, tug and 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 move out on you. Modern automatics certainly are a lot better, but I I don't know. I've never heard of a Volvo box. I've never heard anyone doing this. And I I we used to get so many calls at the shop from people who said, you know, no, you know, I'm diabetic, I've lost a leg, I I got a bum shoulder, I can't shift. My wife would like to drive one, but you know she doesn't drive a stick. There's a market out there for somebody to come up with a with a with a uh, automatic. Oh my gosh, sell lots of them. But the, the short answer, Randy, is no. <laughs> I don't know of one. So Randy's in uh, the Greater Washington D.C. area. He, he'll be happy to work on your MG. So. All right, from Eric to everybody, um, my radiator fan breaker works very intermittently when hot. Is this right? I built a fuse compartment and it has a cover. So Eric, are you still on? This, this, uh, this came in a lot earlier. So, and I still have 39 more messages and we're certainly not gonna get to them all, but Anyway, so we're going to suppose that Eric has a 77 or through 80 MGB. I do, correct. Okay, and what you've got a you you've got a breaker, so it's a 78 through 80. It's What's, an 80. It's an 80. Okay, so there's an ignition relay first. The ignition relay feeds the breaker. The breaker feeds the, the switch in the in the radiator, and that little weeny weeny switch feeds the twin fan motors on the federal and California spec MGBs. The other ones, the all the rest of the world just had one fan, um, and those fan motors draw more current than anything else in the car except the starter motor. It's a huge amount of current that goes through there. If there's anything to put a relay on, it's the fan switch and it's the fan motors, absolutely 77 through 80. And, and that saves the, the switch uh, in, the, in the radiator that only has to trip and, and run the relay. Um, and, you know, it's, um, the switch works when the radiator gets really hot. So and the breaker might be bad. I mean, I say bad. I mean, I thought I'd switched it. The fuse box is, you know, I made a nice pretty fuse box. It's got a cover, but I used one of those breakers that, that fits in the fuse spot. So I used a breaker that goes in there. And um, the breaker was intended for this, right? So it works okay. But I noticed that when the engine compartment is really hot, the fans come on, go off, come on, go off. Not, not, not usually. So maybe there's something having to do with the heat. With the fans come on, the heat gets blown back against some connection you've got, something, and it breaks, and then it cools down a little bit, and then, and then it, it makes a reconnection. That's a possibility. Um, usually, yeah. the, the fan switches come on and stay on for a while. They've got two, two different settings. There's a, once it hits, you know, it, it makes contact, and it's got to cool down quite a lot for it to break. Um, but again, put a relay, if you don't know how to do it, email me tomorrow. I've got, I, I think I've got a sketch of that, uh, that I can email back right away. I always tell people email me and then some people do, and I don't always send the stuff out <laughs> awful about that. Anyway, I'll do my very best, Eric, to, to do that. But, um, put a relay on those, on those fans. That'll, that'll save the switch. It'll save the wiring. 
it's a lot of draw or or knock out one fan um you don't need both fans save save the one for uh, for when the one fan fails really really yeah really I did watch a thing on on radiators a few uh, months ago two months ago whatever but um two fan you don't only need one fan all the rest of the world just used one fan i don't know why we had two it's something it's something having to do with no doubt with DOT and the federal government and all, all that kind of stuff. But California spec and American and federal spec MGBs had two fans. Canadians only had one. England only had one. Hmm. Maybe I'll do that also and just cut out one fan for now. Just, just di disconnect it. I just did that on, yeah. a, on a car up in Minneapolis this past weekend. Um, and the, the, the woman who owned the car, there was no provision for a, for a thermostatic switch. I never saw a radiator like that. So, huh. it, so it, they were just hot wired to run all the time. Well, they take a lot of current and they, oh, the wiring gets all hot and everything. I said, well, here, we'll fix that. <laughs> Separate, <laughs> you know, take, take care of it, so. All right, great, I'll give it a try. Okay, no, Gary. Where, Thanks. Where are you calling from? Uh, Saratoga, New York. Interesting. Is that is that like I mean adjacent to Saratoga Springs? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah same place. Um, yeah, that's where well, that's where I I first saw um, an AMGBA convention in probably 1980. Wow. Um, where where I I saw you know one guy is you know the the cars overheating. I mean the cars were still new then. Um, and uh, the car's overheating and it's just horrible. And he turns, I don't know, the fans finally shut off or I shut the fans off because I was doing, doing my, rolling, my rolling tech 41 years ago. And uh, one fan's going this way and the other fan's going that <laughs> way. Oh, the, the air was just looping through, you know, so. You don't remember where you did it, do you? Uh, at some big hotel. Um, right, right across from the city, uh, there's a city park. Yeah. So, uh, right in that park, they have a beautiful car show every year. And right there, they've got a car museum, um, a very popular car museum. They took the old Saratoga bottling plant and made a big car museum out of it. Very cool. Yeah. Thanks very much. Hey, thank you, Eric. See you later. All right. Thanks. All right, from Brad Worthington, my first name on, on my thank you list from tonight. Uh, I have a 66B, and after purchasing and, re, uh, and rebuilding the three synchro overdrive, my cross member won't fit. The upper bracket is too wide. I'm guessing that the overdrive came out of a GT, but I can't find the more narrow upper bracket. There, there's, uh, is, there must be a bracket for a, for a Four synchro and a bracket for a three synchro, but I'm not even sure that's true. Um, well, the catalogs show two different ones. Okay. Okay. Well, if geez, here comes Paul Deershaw's name again. Um, Paul's a, Paul's a great guy for used parts. If you think you've got the wrong cross member, call Paul Deershaw, sports car craftsman. <laughs> in Arvada, Colorado, and he will send you what you want in that day's mail or the next day's mail. A lot of people out there got parts. I, I get I get those from people every time afterwards, and then I forget to mention the other people who have parts. Um, but Paul will send it up that day or the next day. He'll tell you if, if he's got it, you know, and it's just, it goes in the mail. You get it right away. No screwing around. You don't call the guy three weeks later and say, Dude, are you going to send that cross member? Oh, my dog got sick. Oh, my wife had to go to the hospital. I couldn't find a box big enough. None of that. Paul sends it up that day or the next day. So, um, so, but I just, I can't tell you if that cross member is the same or not. It's, I don't believe it changes between the overdrive and the, and the roadster. That doesn't make any sense to me. I don't remember that at all. Um, yeah, it doesn't make sense to me either. It's an age appropriate gearbox for well, you know. um, do me a favor and and call me um call me back um tomorrow and i i got the factory parts manuals 
the AKD three two two seven, which is the which is the uh, the early the early one for the like the sixty six B, and I'll 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 match that up against the part number of the later one, or just short circuit it and call Paul because he he'll know right off the bat. And if you've got the wrong one, he'll um, he'll tell you. But there's a there's the intermediate saddle, and then there's the mounts, and then there's the then there's the um, the whole bottom bracket. So you got the bottom bracket, you got the mounts, and then you got the inside saddle. So there's there's four pieces there that are critical to get it up into place. And when I was putting the cross member onto my daughter's MGB GT, we got overdrive for that. After about, after about three hours of cursing very, very loudly, as a matter of fact, I don't know. Phil's probably not on anymore, but Phil and I tried for about two hours one day, couldn't get it. We could get three bolts, no problem. Couldn't get the fourth one. And the next day I tried for at least an hour and I was cursing like a sailor and my daughter finally said, dad, let me do it. And I said, but you're a girl. And she went down there and about five minutes later, she had them all started because her fingers are the size of a pencil and mine are the size of a, uh, a lot bigger than a Vienna sausage. So anyway, I just couldn't get my, my great big fingers in there. Anyway, Brad, that's a, you can call me or call Paul tomorrow, or if you don't got if you don't have Paul's number, call me and I'll, I'll get you that. So, thank Please. you, sir. Where where are you calling from, Brad? Uh, Rockland, California. Okay, all right. Where it's sunny all the time. So all right. So. See you, sir. So we're, um, we're now we're into and and probably Anthony, my father and I have a 66 B just got it running. Oh, this is about the horn and the, okay. Uh, we already answered that one. Uh, David, uh, Vasily, is there, a, uh, and I probably mispronounced that, excuse me. Is there a way to test the viability of the clutch in when it appears to be on the point of needing replacement? So just, just David, are you still online? We're, we're, we're 925, I'm gonna have to cut this off here pretty soon. We're down to 87 participants for our, from our high of, what did Doug say, 157, I think. Um, so is there a way to test the viability of a clutch and when it appears to be at the point of needing replacement? An MGB clutch lasts around 50,000 miles. Now, you can wreck a brand new clutch in no miles, and if you're Bob and Gloria, they're probably still driving on the same clutch because all they do is drive on the expressway. So it just, it just depends on, on the use that, that it gets. There are two faults with the clutch. One is hydraulic, one is the clutch itself. If you have a failure to disengage, meaning that you can't put the car in gear, you can't put it in reverse without it going, without the teeth grinding, a failure to disengage, that's almost always hydraulic. You can have a failure of the clutch disc on the inside and that will cause, the, um, cause it to, to get stuck and you can't get a disengage, but almost always hydraulics. In any case, you always do the hydraulics first. The master, the, the hose, and the slave. You're gonna have to, if you do the main clutch, you're gonna have to do the hydraulics anyway. So you might as well do them first and just see if that takes care of it but that's disengagement. Failure to engage is a worn clutch. A clutch disc starts off at, at a certain thickness and as it wears, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. And as a result, your disengagement point, when you press on the pedal, when the clutch is brand new and fresh, you can depress the clutch two thirds of the way down, three quarters of the way down before it disengages. And then as it wears, the dis disengagement point keeps climbing up and up and up and up. And finally, you don't have to touch the pedal at all. And it disengages, it slips. So if you can just barely touch the pedal and it's slipping, yeah, it's time for a clutch. So if you have the clutch done professionally, where the engine comes out of the car, you got motor mounts, you got side cover gaskets, you got the clutch, you got the hydraulics, you got 2,500 bucks. I mean, I'm, I'm just 
shooting a number out there. I don't do this anymore, but it's a huge job. But when it needs to be done, you don't, you never take an engine out and not change the clutch. So there's a rear engine seal, a front engine seal, there's all kinds of stuff to do it at the same time. So. From Sean. Hey John, I'm new to MG ownership. I pulled the engine and trans out of my 63B to get ready for paint. 69,000 on the motor. Any recommended, just a minute, any recommended services, words of wisdom that I should do while the motor is out as a precautionary measure from Ambler, Pennsylvania. So, Sean, did you wait long enough for me to answer your question or did you sign off already? Hang on, John. Hey, here we go. All right. So, <clears throat> the engine and gearbox out of a 63B, 63B does not have a rear seal on the engine. So, there's nothing you can do there. Um, you can take a look at the ring gear on the flywheel and see how badly it's chewed up. It, it's chewed up 180 degrees out um, on an angle. And um, you can, you might choose to take the flywheel off and put a, a new ring gear on. If you buy a pre-engaged starter, sometimes you can get by with a crappy old ring gear anyway. You should change the front seal on the engine. The very earliest MGBs had an oil seal that fit from the outside in. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Those don't work. They quickly replace those with the style that fits from the inside out. If you're going to change the front cover, then you might as well change the front pulley and go from a pressed steel pulley to a harmonic balancer. Here we are back at Paul Deershaw's shop again. And if you're the timing marks on your car right now, you got three timing marks at six o'clock. So you get to crawl on your belly like a snake to, to time the car. But in 1972, they put the timing marks up at 11 o'clock. So you can see what's going on. And there's five of them up there. So it's, it's a whole lot easier to time the car. So you can make a case for changing the front pulley and the front cover and getting those higher oil, uh, higher timing marks. Of course, when you take the timing cover off, there lies the chain and the chain tensioner. Both of those are worn. My wife warned, my late wife Caroline warned that once you take the engine apart, it develops an appetite and pretty soon you're changing everything. No matter what you look at, it's gonna be faulty. So if you look at the lifters, they're shot, their shot, the cam shot, and, and uh, 69,000, they may not be shot, but the bearings are, absolutely. So take the sump off the engine, change the center main, it's frustrating, you gotta buy a main bearing kit that has, that has five main bearings in it, and you're only gonna use one, real frustrating, but that's all you can do, you can't change the front or rear without taking the whole engine apart. Change the, uh, the connecting rod bearings, absolutely. Change the oil pump, put in a brand new oil pump, or if you can still get guts, rebuild your oil pump. Put in a new pre oil pressure relief valve. I know you're writing all this stuff down as fast as I'm talking. You can call me later, I'll tell you this whole stuff again, explain it more thoroughly and why you should do it. Um, take the head off, no, I wouldn't necessarily, the, the, you can get the head off later on, easy enough. Change the piston rings, no, not unless you know that it's chewing up more oil than you want to put in. Even if, even if it's chewing up a quart every 500 miles, you know, a quart every tank full, well, that's, that's exotic, exotic. But um, if it's chewing up a quart every 250 miles, um, still you can buy an awful lot of oil for, for the expense of, of taking the engine apart, honing it, putting rings in it, and so forth. On the other hand, uh, an, oil, an oil consumption of a quarter or two per 500 is pretty excessive. So anyway, at least the bearings, at least the bearings. Front, a front seal on the gearbox, rear seal on, on the gearbox, uh, the release bearing fork, bolt and bushing. So already I've overspent your budget by a factor of three, right? <laughs> so that's pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, call me, call me tomorrow, Sean, and uh, I'd be happy to go over this stuff with you again. But 
but uh, that's real nice. So you, you painting the whole underbonnet area or what? Going to do the whole body and the whole engine area and underneath as well, cleaning that up too. Very, very cool. What what color is, is it? Iris blue? Um, it's originally white and we're going to convert it over to uh, racing green. Okay. Okay. That's very nice. Yep. Yeah, when you when you change color on a car, you know, it just just because it came out of the factory white doesn't mean it always has to be white. And a white MGB is like a, being a permanent teenager. There's always a zit on it someplace. Black is black's always dirty too, but not like not like white. And one little dot of rust it looks just so awful on it. Green's a real pretty color. Um, have you selected the green that you're going to use? No, not yet. So go out to the car lot. There aren't very many, I don't think there are many green car. Green's not a popular color right now, but go out, go out to the car lot. Just go out and look, look through the Pontiacs and the Fords and the General Motors and the, um, do they make Pontiacs anymore? I'm not a car guy. I, I don't, I'm, I'm way out of my league here, but anyway, go, go to the, um, go to the car lot, look and see if you can find a, a color that's been made in the last 10 years that you like. And then, then you can get the um, body shop to paint it that color, and you can get touch-up paint in a duplicolor spray can or a, a little a little bottle at Napa, you know, for the next ten years. So, appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, no, good luck. Good luck. Oh, you must have absolutely positively. You must have. Um, before you begin to put this thing back apart and back together again, you must have the factory parts manual, AKD3227. It's available uh, as, a, as a DVD. Uh, you can probably find it if you look, just keep looking on, on eBay, buy an original one. You've got to pay a premium because it's an original factory part. You know, again, we got form and function. What you're after here is the function. AKD3227, I'll tell you all this stuff tomorrow, but it shows you the location of every single nut and bolt on that car and how, and how it's assembled. It's more important than the workshop manual for reassembly. So. Well, thank you. Where, where are you calling from? Uh, Ambler, PA, okay. All right, thanks. We're at 9.35, um, we are, um, oh my gosh, I could just keep going and there's 40 more messages. Most of the people have probably signed off by, by now, but let me remind you that you can call me anytime. I, I, ju I just want to say that I, I respond to 99.9% .9 of my phone calls. If you email, because I'm too busy to answer, you know, you don't want to bother me. Uh, it's, it's not always, I'm not Ann Landers who always claimed that she answered every letter that she got. I, I just, I, the volume of stuff I get, I, I'd love to. I'd like, I, if I could just do that all day long, it would be great, but my sprinkler's been running for two and a half hours. I gotta go turn that off. I gotta work on my daughter's car tomorrow. I gotta go to the Secretary of State's office tomorrow. I got an appointment in Michigan. It took me two months. I've been driving on expired plates for, for a year and a half um, because the, the Secretary of State shut down during COVID. Um, so they're expired plates, but the governess says that's okay. That's all right. You know, as long as you got an appointment with the with the uh, secretary of state, and I got a. So anyway, I got all this stuff going, and I wish I could just sit and answer everybody's question. If you call me, it's real hard for real hard for me to avoid answering your, your call, and I'm I'm so pleased to answer your call. Let me make my last pitch for going to my website, universitymotorsltd.com. Looking for that yellow PayPal button, pushing, pushing the PayPal button and uh, helping me afford my retirement and for answering your questions and so forth. I do greatly, greatly, greatly. I truly do appreciate everyone's support. And I wish I could be in everyone's town for a week this year and help. I wish I could go to Randy's in, in DC and hang out there for a month and fix 10% fix, uh, of the cars of 10% of the MGs in the DC area. Wish I could. Wish I could have stayed up in Minneapolis at, at Mark Brando's shop and and uh, worked on more of his cars up there. I love doing it. I this is. I was born to fix MGs and uh, I just love doing it. So anyway, thank you for your support. And I think we'll have our next one on Monday, the the opening night of um, 
MG 2021 in Atlantic City, unless otherwise indicated. So until then, I'm gonna, I, I, you can unmute yourself and, and I will, uh, we can say goodbye to each other. And I appreciate everyone being here. So thanks. Thank you, thank you John. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Good, Good to see you. Ned, nice Cheers. You. Doug Clark, I love your beard. Cheers. John, um, I think you should, I, I want to point out, this is actually a ventilated pit helmet. Good well, for wait, summer wear. Uh, gonna... It's very small holes for air ventilation. Well, here, hang on just a minute. <laughs> uh -oh. Okay. Get them off. I almost bought one, so we all show up with pith helmets. Yeah, we should, yeah. This is why I wear this when I work in the golf course. Doesn't protect me from golf balls, but keeps the sun off the back of my neck. Steve, you is. <laughs> you ever get pissed off? <laughs> he went to get his helmet that is a uh, former wife's uh, father had from India. That's what he's going to be coming back with. <laughs> no, he, first of all, he's coming back with just his hair, but this is the one that I got from Art Lewis that I used to wear at the summer parties. Uh, Art got it, thought it was real slick. Art's wife wouldn't let him wear it. Thought it looks, <laughs> well, anyway, that's, you know, when you're married, everything is a balance. So anyway, that's my, that's that one. I have an earlier pith helmet that I bought in an in a, in a Army Navy store. And I wore this to when I went to Philmont Scout Ranch in 1963. So this is, this is uh, some kind of fiberglass or something or other on, on the inside, but I still have that. And then as Doug said, my late wife's, uh, Caroline's grandfather, who was um, British Army. So this says, uh, Tress and Company, London, and uh, it was made in Barbados. And so this is a real, honest to goodness, pith helmet. So yeah, I like that. Uh, Doug, <laughs> Doug and I have pith helmet wars. So <laughs> we, we pith on each other, you know. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thanks, John. Good to see you, man. <laughs> Doug, thank you for coming tonight. Thanks for your contributions. Always okay. good, John. And I enjoyed everyone's questions. Hey, thanks, Bob and Gloria. Thanks. I'm still, I, I got to get downstairs and find that first place plaque for you. I, uh, it's well, on we, my yeah, list. Don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> on my list. We're not Thank holding you. our breath, though. Okay. <laughs> hey, hey, John, for, thanks for a newbie, say your website again. Uh, the, my website is, is universitymotorsltd.com. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. So anyway, Tom Snook, thank you. Thank you for your support. Hope, hope things are nice in Florida. So Ron Nugent, thank you for being here. And uh, thank you, Greg and uh, Duffy with your 76 MGB. Thanks for being here. Thanks Dennis, so John. Barney, thanks for, thanks for always coming in. Crystal Johnson, it's very kind. And uh, Vern Notstein, Vern, real nice talking to you last week. Uh, sorry to hear about your son. And uh, um, so anyway, thanks to everybody. And, and I, appreciate, I appreciate the support. And if you got any questions, call me, because that's what I love doing is answering questions. So. Good night, John. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Adios, everyone.